You guys know who I am and what we're talking about today. So fruit trees are a world of their own. So the reason I say that is um, they're really heavily bred, a lot like crops. You don't find corn growing in the wild. You don't find um, chihuahuas in the wild. In fact, you know, if chihuahuas were left in the wild, they probably wouldn't survive incredibly long. They've been, so they've been bred to fit man's needs and, or, or people's needs. And fruit trees are pretty much the same way. They've been bred to produce these huge crops. And in a lot of cases, that's because um, in bad years, they won't produce hardly anything at all. So regardless of why, some trees can produce enough fruit to actually pull themselves apart. So trees have to be pruned. Uh, fruit trees have to be pruned. Unlike most other regular trees, you hear people talk about, oh, I had to prune my tree. It was this, it was that. Most trees really don't require pruning to take care of them. Fruit trees are an exception. And that's sort of why they're a world of their own. Um, unlike a lot of the other crops out there, they are perennial. So this pruning stuff kind of matters and they've been bred for production and nobody has bred very, not nobody, very few fruit trees have been bred with crop, with pest resistance in mind because even if you have the most pest resistant apple tree in the world, if nobody wants to eat the apples because they don't taste good, it doesn't matter. And if you have an apple that's great, and everybody wants it, you can sell it. Yeah, fruit, so the disease question is sort of secondary in, in this um, thing. So uh, this is not, okay. So let's start talking about just the basics of fruit trees. So is this what a fruit tree system looks like? Anybody? Oh, you guys are all muted. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna do the question and answer thing. It's not, it's not gonna work this, that well on this one. So we'll just sit down and say, this is not what a fruit tree root system looks like. Although, you know, that's sort of the popular imagination. And there are one or two trees in the world where the top does, the bottom, the roots do mimic the top. Only one or two. Fruit trees, this is sort of an idealized idea of what the root system of a fruit tree looks like. Um, it's at least closer to accurate, but back in the day, um, right after the Soviet Union, uh, in the early part of the 1900s, early era part of the communist revolution, um, they basically killed anybody who had did too many controversial uh, research projects. So this professor of fruit trees spent years excavating um, uh, root systems just so he could figure out exactly where they were. And that was not too controversial. It was in a really deep soil. So you'll notice that some of the roots go down 10 feet here. And that's not always the case. Roots will only go down 10 feet if you've got 10 feet of topsoil, which he did. But you'll notice that it's really not evenly distributed. It goes out and explores things, kind of stops near the edge of the road when you're looking at plan view. And it sort of invades some of other trees territories, but not a lot. It sort of tends to stay out of those for the most part. Um, so, you know, the reality of fruit tree root systems, or any tree's root systems for that matter, are, are a lot messier than what we idealize. So, th th so that's sort of the structure of, of at least the parts we can't see. Let's, a little bit about the growth of um, roots, shoots, and fruit. You'll notice that when they graphed this, it says stage one, stage two, stage three instead of winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, and that's because it, it, they don't really quite fit into the winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, in the, trees don't read calendars, I guess, is the easiest way to say it. And the problem is also that, you know, when these things occur is gonna be um, a little bit more in California, it's gonna be very different in California than it is in Minnesota. Um, so. Suffice it to say that mostly in California, you've got root elongation occurring uh, when you've got water in the, in the environment. And then once things warm up a little bit and you start getting into February, March, 
you start getting the very first parts of the um, of the fruit formation. And this is these are flowers, actually. And that's why you see in the middle of stage one, this dashed line sort of being this, this, in, this sudden increase in the middle of winter or toward the end of winter. Those are the flowers. And so then it, you hit a slump in the flower production while new sh shoots are being produced right in the middle of stage two. And so all those shoots, a lot of your energy is going into producing new leaves. And then your energy goes back into the fruit once the leaves have le you know, fully formed. And then at fruit drop, all of the production stops and the, we go right back into root production. So that's our annual cycle, if you will, for your sort of model fruit tree. And those, the exact time that these things happen um, is gonna depend a little bit on the varietal and where you are in your microclimates and all kinds of other fun stuff. And this is for rosaceous fruit trees, I should mention. Citrus don't necessarily follow all these rules. Um, they tend to be, um, they'll be producing fruit often into the winter, uh, right about the time that their roots are still growing too. Okay, so one of the things that a lot of fruit trees require is chill um, in order for them to produce fruit. And this, is, and, and this is not just fruit trees. You'll run into some other temperate tree species require chill for them to actually understand when winter is over. But it matters to us because in, um, when we're talking about fruit trees, if trees don't get enough chill, they won't produce fruit because they'll never figure out, quote unquote, that winter's over. So chilling, basically, it, the, the tree sort of knows, if you will, um, that winter lasts at least X number of cold hours and it refuses to wake up if it doesn't get those numbers of cold hours. The funny thing is that chilling has been defined uh, in different terms at different times. So you're gonna find that the numbers can be a bit all over the board. So it's technically, the, originally it was just defined as the number of hours below 45 degrees Fahrenheit which worked out eh, kind of okay, um, but the no chill hour numbers between Minnesota and here were not consistent when you used that kind of a definition. And the reason is because they figured out a little bit later that nothing happened below freezing. There, the, the trees were not recording chill hours once it got below 32 hours. So if you're in Minnesota and you spend all, you know, the entire time between December and February below 32 degrees um, every day, then the plant's not picking up any chill hours during that time. So you'll, if you just define it as 45 and below, you're recording this massive number of chill hours. And in California, you know, you're not. And yet both trees are producing okay. So the revised definition is now between 32 and 45. So if you see some really old varietals out there, they can have these really large numbers of fruit, of chill hours required to get the tree to fruit, especially if they were developed in Minnesota in the 1800s or something. And those aren't accurate anymore, um, unfortunately. That makes it a little challenging. Most of these have been uh, removed, but if you look in older sources, you may find some really outlandish numbers for chill hours. Of course, once we figured this out, then somebody had to get their PhD and say, well, really, the number of hours that you pick up at 33, 34, and 35 degrees is really only about a half hour for every hour and right around 45 too. So you can also see some pretty sophisticated models that more accurately measure chill hours. The problem is that that work hasn't been done for all varietals, so it gets really hard to know what um, what everybody's talking about. At least these numbers should be a little closer to the 32 to 45 general rule. But for most purposes, you'll see some variation out there. So there are several different models. This is the simple definition. So what happens if they don't get enough um, chill? Well, you can get um, the buds may die. They may, they, the flower buds may start and then just uh, stop. They, they, for mysterious, you get fruit abortion, it's called. You can get extended blooms where the buds don't open up until, you know, 
April or May when all the other ones have been, and um, poor fruit set. So you just don't get, even though the tree blooms okay, you don't get much in, in the way of fruit from that. And so these can all be chill uh, related. Now, again, we're talking about our classic rosaceous fruits and those are defined as, you know, um, all the apples, all the pears, all the, so those are palm fruits, the stone fruits being, you know, apricots, cherries, peaches, um, plums, those kinds of things. Um, we're not talking so much about citrus. We're not talking about olive, although olive's technically a fruit, you know, um, that kind of stuff. Okay, so when we're talking about chill, we're almost everywhere in Marin gets more than 400 chill hours every year. So if you're shopping for a fruit tree, you're pretty much guaranteed, at least for now, to be getting more than 400 chill hours, no matter where you are. That said, we have had <laughs> some spots near the bay in particular on warm seasons with warm years get less than 400 chill hours. And the problem is that if temperatures get above, say, about 70 degrees, it starts rolling the chill hour clock backwards. So we had some temperatures that were in the 70s this last, um, this last February. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with the, the number of, of chill hours that the plants in the milder areas get. In the chillier, in, in the colder areas, they're still gonna be above 400. But if you see a plant that needs 800 or 1,000 chill hours, and I had a case like that where in Belvedere, somebody had planted um, an apple that required quite a bit of chill hours and it never got it and the poor thing never woke up. So um, that it, will, it can actually kill your plant. It may not just be uh, fruit, it may not just be poor fruit set. If, it's, if the plant really requires a lot of chill hours, it'll just never leaf out. Um, and that's, that's something you don't wanna do. So you need to look up your microclimates. If you wanna figure out where your microclimates are, you can go to the home, home orchard uh, at um, UC Day, you can, you've got the whole um, URL right there. And you can go check out what the chill hours are in your neck of the woods. Now, these are recorded on these um, CIMA stations, which stands for the California Irrigation Management Information System. I think that, is that on the next slide? No, it's not. So, so what you see are the three CIMA stations that are in um, that, are, that are functional right now, although two has been taken offline. So we only have two now that are functional, I'm sorry. And um, one of them's supposed to be out near Black Point, the other one's out, supposed to be out near Peacock Gap, although it doesn't show it quite right where they are. I think that's actually IVC and that one's not working either. I know there's one out in Black Point, so um, I think these dots are not correct. But the problem is for those of us in West Marin, there's nothing that really um, calculates chill hours. So if you need to go and try and find this information, I, I, I think the home orchard still has approximated values for you um, for even in places like West Marin. The other option is to go to um, Wonderground or that's the weather, that, which is short for weather underground. But you can go to the weather underground and this has um, people's, the way the weather underground works is it basically takes everybody's home weather stations that are connected to the internet and records all that information and then uses that to predict the weather in all kinds of places. The problem with this approach is that um, the, well, the benefit of the California Irrigation Management Information System is that these stations are maintained and professionally calibrated. And the problem with all the homeowner sites is they're not necessarily, they may be, but they're not necessarily maintained and they're not necessarily professionally calibrated. And that means that the data can be pretty off. Now, the law of averages sort of says that even if they're off, you know, some are going to be off too high, some are going to be off too low. And most, most of the time when you average it out over a, a large area, it's going to be reasonably accurate. Um, whether that's true or not, you know, remains to be seen. But you can get information from 
uh, the weather underground on chill hours and other fun things like that. You have to dig. The home orchard is much more set up for being able to get this kind of stuff. So I'd start at the home orchard, orchard first, and if that doesn't provide what you need, then go try places like weather underground. Okay, so what else do they need besides chill? They need sunlight. And this is a minimum of six hours a day. Now, the thing is, does a tree care how many hours of sunlight it's getting when it has no leaves? And I know you can't tell me yes or no, because you guys are um, watching, you know, muted here. But the answer is pretty much no, it doesn't care. So when we're talking about a minimum of six hours per day, it's about when the trees are in leaf. So you do need about six hours a day minimum in March all the way through about October. And if you can't get that, then you don't have enough sunlight to produce fruit. Because what is fruit? I mean, what do we value in fruit? Okay, with the exception of Eureka lemons, most of the time that's sugar. Um, you know, and the only what, sugar is a carbohydrate. And the only way you make carbohydrates is with carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. If you don't have enough sunlight, you're not making any sugars. So your trees are, um, not going to produce sweet fruit. So you may be able to grow trees with less than six hours per day, but it may be pretty much a waste of your time. And the tree may simply not set fruit um, beyond, a certain, beyond a certain point. Okay, so um, pollinization of fruit trees. Uh, so you'll notice um, or pollination of fruit trees. There are two things. There's pollination and there's pollinizers. So um, pollinators are bees. They pollinate the tree. Pollinizers are the source of the pollen. So this is another fruit tree that provides the pollen that needs, that, that the tree may need to produce fruit. And this all goes back to some sort of self-incompatibility. Um, so the reason that most trees require a, a different tree to pollinize them, or a, or a bee to pollinate them with um, pollen from a different tree, is that a tree, the trees don't want to be inbred. So they don't want to accept their own pollen to fertilize their flowers because that's just not good genetics from, you know, we all understand that, I think. Um, and we don't want, you know, even our close relatives, you know, our potential mothers or fathers or daughters or sons to be the pollen source for our flowers. We want to cross out. So plants have developed what's called self incompatibility. So they won't if pollen is so closely related that it can recognize the pollen as self, the flower will not accept it. So we have bred trees to overcome that trait because half the time we're propagating these things by um, cuttings anyway. They're not, we're not growing them from seed, so we don't care. So we have found varietals in many trees that will pollinize them, or, pollinize themselves. In other trees, we have, they produce grapefruit, but they, we haven't found a varietal that produces grapefruit and is self-pollinizing. So therefore, they have to cross out. So this makes things kind of messy because whether or not you require another tree to pollinize your tree depends on your varietal. So we're going to take a little quick look at what this might look like. Okay, so this is a pollinizer, this is a pollinator. Unfortunately, this pollinator has that big shiny varroa mite right on the middle of its back. But, um, but bees are our pollinators and we need them. Okay, so we're gonna talk really quickly about pollinizer for varieties for sweet cherries. Now these are, you know, we're only, you're gonna need to look up what your fruit tree needs in terms of your thing, unless you're sweet cherries and then it's right here for you. Um, but here are some examples of the things that we, um, what is that one? Okay, so Bing and Lambert are two varieties that absolutely require pollinization. Um, and they can be 
crossed with Black Tartan, Van, and Rainier. Rainier um, requires pollinization in order to do it, and it'll accept just about anything. Um, so it's, it's not very choosy about who it sleeps, sleeps around with. Van, Lambert, Black Tartan, Bing, the whole nine yards, it will cross with them. Royal Anne, on the other hand, is somewhat choosy, um, as befits Royal Anne's name, perhaps, and it will only cross with Van or Black Tartan. But look who, um, anyway, um, but Black Tartan and Van will, will cross with absolutely anything. So I don't know what that says about Royal Anne's taste in partners. Um, and then you've got Lapin and Stella that are so fruitful, so you don't have to worry about um, any of this mess. Uh, you can just plant those and they'll be, they'll be great on their own. So, I mean, so you can sort of see this is, it's not that complicated, but if you need um, to say, if you've got some cherries and you don't know uh, what they are, you can pretty much say Black Tartan crosses with almost everything on this list. Van crosses with almost anything on this list. So you can say, oh, I can just go buy a Blan Van or Black Tartan and I can plant it and I've got a pretty good shot at having that be a good pollinizer for me. Um, you wouldn't want to plant Royal Anne as your pollinizer. It doesn't cross with very many different things, especially, you know, if you're growing Bings, it's just, it's, it's not going to happen. So, um, you know, some, some ways to think about how you're going to tackle the, the cherry thing. Ultimately, um, if you've got a fruit tree and it's flowering like mad and never sets any fruit, you might just go out and look for another fruit tree varietal, I'm sorry, not, another, another of the same species, so another cherry or another apricot, whatever, that's flowering at about the same time and get a cutting and try um, putting it in a thing of water and, and bringing it back to your tree. This is all the pollen it will take to get that tree to set a pretty good fruit crop. And if you figure that out, um, you know, and it's just a surreptitious little snip on one of your neighbor's trees, that kind of thing. And if it works for you, you could go get another snip the next year and go to the California Rare Fruit Growers where they have grafting trials and you could graft that onto any kind of rootstock that you felt you needed that would be compatible and you could have that there forever. Or you could just take a snip out of that tree every year when it's flowering and bring it in and, and get your thing. So it's not that difficult to overcome if you can find the right one. Um, okay, so that's, that's sort of um, the flowering and pollinization and chill hours and all the other good fun stuff. What, if, what about the soil requirements for fruit and nut trees? So, we say requirements like it's this really hard and fast rule, and it's not, but um, if you can't meet these rules, it does become a little challenging. So for most fruit and nut trees, you want three to five feet of decent soil. So you'll find that most orchards that you see for um, palm and stones are planted in riparian areas or other places that have some pretty good top soil. Um, the minimum depth is one to two feet. Um, you know, my mom has planted an entire orchard in Placer County on six inches of topsoil. And she asked me, you know, um, you know, what should I do? And I said, you can't plant fruit trees. So of course she went right out and planted an orchard. It's been about 10 years. She's gotten a few apples. Um, but uh, so you, it can be done. I don't, think, I don't think she's ever gotten more than one or two apricots. So that's very expensive apricots. Um, she has decent drainage, so it works OK. Um, so your alternatives, if you don't have this kind of soil, is, are potentially wine barrels, but wine barrels are pretty small. They're not a lot of space for a tree. So if you're going to try that, you probably want to stick with dwarf varietals. You can build some raised beds. Um, you could put in uh, trencher lines. You could, uh, which are great big trenches that you dig into the soil and have um, French drains go underneath that, that so that it will actually drain and that kind of stuff. 
or you can auger holes in clay pans if, uh, and those have all been sort of successfully used with, to a greater or lesser degree. The augering only works if you've got decent drainage underneath that you can auger too. Otherwise, you're just augering these giant swimming pools that are going to fill up with water and kill your trees. So, um, you know, so there are, are alternatives. They're very site specific. Um, if, but you can get things done. And you know, my mom's orchard is still, it's still there and, and the trees aren't big, but they're, they're going. Okay, so a lot of people have the misconception that when you plant trees, you should backfill with, um, with amendments. And uh, that is not true. Uh, you really need to backfill your trees. You need to plant your trees as much as possible in native soil. And if you don't have good drainage or some other problem like that, then you need to tackle that with what we just discussed before, you know, raised beds or something along those lines. Um, the problem being that you end up with this soil uh, interface where you, where you plant. So what we've got illustrated here is the proper planting for a bald and burlap tree, but it's pretty much the same if you just took that little ball away from the root system, it's pretty much the same for a bare root tree. You're going to just dig the, the hole fairly shallow and quite wide, enough that the top of the tree sits a little bit above grade. Um, you want your root flare uh, right at soil grade, but you can mound up to that root flare and allow the tree to, and, and then once you planted the tree, you want to backfill with native soil. You want absolutely no fill underneath the tree. You can put a little bit of amendment above the soil grade. See where that dotted line is, where the soil grade goes about right, halfway right through the root ball? That dotted line marks the line of where you want to just, below that line, you want to backfill with native soil. And above that line, where you, toward the mulch side of things, if you want to work some amendment into your soil, that's the place to put it because the amendment will inevitably break down and the soil will shrink away and you don't want it shrinking away underneath your plant. Um, so if you've got a, if you really want to work amendments into your soil, you should work um, and, and you're going to work with uncomposted amendments. Those have to be done months before planting. Um, you don't want to amend soil and even if you do composted amendments, those should probably be done also a month or two before planting. You do not want to have pockets of undecomposed organic matter in heavy soils. Um, and if you want to replenish the mulch or, or the composted materials, you do that at the surface. And you know, a good example of this, I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but my dentist uh, wanted to barter work for a while with me when he, um, you know, so he was like, look, you, I'll work on your teeth, you work on your, um, you work on my trees and we'll call it even kind of thing. And, and that seemed like a, might be a good idea. And one of the very first things he did was ask me how to plant. And I basically told him to do this. And he went out and said, well, you know, you said to do that, but I decided to go one step better. And he dug these amazing holes. Um, oh, okay, well, we're getting into planting and I'm, I, I got a little off track, but track there. So I'm going to go back to my dentist in a little bit. So some fruit tree terms that we're going to um, go to. Let's, let's talk about them. Um, you're going to hear some terms and they're, I'm sure most of you are familiar with these, but I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So we're going to go over them anyway. So one is the root stock, sometimes just abbreviated to stock. This is the tree below the graft union because most fruit trees are grafted. And there's a reason for that. And we'll get into that a little bit later. The scion is the part of the tree that you're trying to keep. Um, that's the part that you're grafting onto the rootstock. That's the one that's going to produce the fruit that you want. And so that's sort of the, the, the important part, although honestly, it's an organism, you know, um, it's a bit of a Frankenstein of an organism, but it's an organism. So it, uh, it's all important. The, when we say crown, I'm usually referring to the root crown. The problem with that term is that some people talked about the canopy of the tree and talk about that as being the crown of the tree. And that's not what I'm talking about. So when I, refer to the canopy, I'm going to talk about the canopy. And generally, when I refer to the crown, I'm referring to the root crown. And that's the portion of the roots 
that are just right around where all the major roots split off from the trunk. That is the root crown. There are, cons there are considered to be about three different sizes of, of trees. They are referred to as standard. The standard trees are usual, that are sold in the trade today are usually a 20 to 25 foot tree. Some apple trees, when you go to their native, you know, where natives are originally from, which is, you know, the mountains around Afghanistan and um, Pakistan, uh, the apple trees there can be as tall as 80 feet. And I've seen some t apple trees that are well over the 25 foot. They've got to be 40 or 50 feet tall in Santa Cruz. Um, then there are semi-dwarf apple, apple trees, and these are all on a dwarfing rootstock. And these tend to be, you know, somewhere around 15 to 20 feet high. And then you get genetic dwarfs. Now these are not um, on a dwarfing rootstock. They are usually on standard uh, rootstocks. But when we talk about semi-dwarfs, you can actually get rootstocks that are, um, that are not semi-dwarf. You can get seriously dwarfing rootstocks that'll keep the trees down to around the 10, 12 foot range. And then there's the genetic dwarfs that are on their own rootstocks that only grow to eight to 12 feet. And this is, these are only really available for peaches, nectarines, apples, and some citrus varietals. So let's talk about very briefly, you know, what a genetic dwarf is. Here's one up here. This is um, a peach by my best guess of appearances, maybe a plum. Um, and so it's not on a grafted rootstock, neither is this peach or nectarine. And you can see how full and heavy these canopy and small they are. That's because the inner nodes on the dwar genetic dwarf um, are much shorter. So it's a little hard to see, but you can sort of see that when you get to a full sized on the left, you can see the pictures of the, the points between the nodes are pretty good sized. And on the right, they're much, much shorter. So that's a genetic dwarf, and it doesn't need um, any special, per particularly special rootstock. But um, there are some problems with, with the, the dwarfs, and one of them is that a little tree has a little root system. Regardless of whether you put it on a, a, a dwarfing rootstock or it's just a genetic dwarf, even if it's on its own root system, the tree is smaller, so the root system's smaller. And that means what? Well, it means it's going to not be as good as a standard tree at chasing water and getting nutrients. So that means it's going to require more care. So that's a little bit like why I made the Chihuahua reference. I'm not picking on Chihuahuas, but any domesticated plant or animal isn't going to be as good at thriving on its own. If you leave for a couple weeks on vacation, your standard apple or your standard peach is going to probably be fine, whereas your genetic dwarf in a barrel may not have such an easy time of it. And if your, your automatic irrigation system breaks while you're gone, that may be the end of that tree. So um, even if it's in native soil, if it's hot and it's dry and it's got this tiny root system, it just can't forage for water, even if it's not in a barrel. So um, there are genetic dwarves require more attention and care um, in the grand scheme of things than your other trees. So you may have to have them on de dedicated irrigation systems. You may have to have your gardeners check to make sure that's working while you're on vacation. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about structure. Um, and let's see how we're doing on time. I wanna make sure it's a little after 10. I'm gonna keep going uh, maybe toward more toward 10.30. I mean, everybody's at home. If you need to get up and go to the bathroom or whatever you need to do, you know, please don't let me stop you. Um, I know this isn't as much fun. It's not as much fun for me because we don't get to have a conversation back and forth, but you know, we're doing what we can. So we're gonna talk a little bit about scaffolding branches. Um, these are, when we talk about a scaffolding branch or a scaffolding limb, this is a main structural limb. So on this picture on the right, you can see that, you know, say the first bottom one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe even eight or nine branches are all what you would probably consider scaffolding limbs. They've got other smaller, these limbs come off and have other branches coming off of them. As you get to the top of the tree, they're just branches. The scaffolding limbs are what it's all about in terms of fruit tree production. 
because the horizontal branches are the ones that produce by far the most fruit. Vertical branches produce less. On those branches, you may find fruiting spurs, particularly when it comes to some stone fruits and all of the pones, so apples and pears, all fruit on spurs. Um, so, and, and the spurs should look like, do we have pictures of, well, we've got some other things. Okay, um, but the spurs should be these little tiny branches that you're seeing in the right-hand picture that are coming off of these bigger branches. So the big branch has this little short spur instead of this long whip of a um, shoot. And uh, this, those are gonna be your fruiting spurs. So they're short twigs that come off of bigger branches, at least two, a year or two old. And we'll look at some of these a little later in the thing. So the other things we're gonna wanna look at are bud scale scars. Um, so you can see at the top of this white, uh, on, this, on the thing on the right, at the top of this shoot, we have these things called bud scales. If you go down about halfway the thing, you'll see this ring of bud scale scars from previous years. So that happens every winter when the tree goes dormant, it sets a whole ring of these bud scales around and just keeps the terminal bud ready for next year's growth. And that will leave a little ring of scars. So that's how you can tell. You just go down the branch until you find this ring. And it's usually not that hard on most fruit trees. And you can figure out what the, this season's growth is. The reason this matters is because some plants, some trees bloom on one-year-old wood. So that is just last year's growth. Some trees won't bloom until two, until they, until it's two years old. And so your trees are gonna fruit differently. And if you're ever gonna prune these trees, you need to know how, what your trees, how they're gonna flower and fruit. Because if you cut off all the fruiting spurs, you've just wiped out your fruit production. It will not fruit this year and it won't, may not fruit next year. Um, so anyway, so the internode is this area between the buds and you'll notice that you get, um, we can, well, actually we're gonna look at other images for our uh, flowering buds versus our fruiting buds. Um, water sprouts. A water sprout is, so a lot of people call anything that grows out of a tree a sucker, but technically suckers are, are root tissue. They only come up from the base. The reason this matters to us for fruit trees is, and this, you know, obviously, if you've got a grafted fruit tree, the stuff that's coming up from the roots are not the scion. That's not gonna produce decent fruit tip 90% of the time. It's gonna produce bad, well, less tasty fruit. Why? Because the, the rootstock has been bred for re disease resistance, not for fruit production. So you're, so that they've never been bred with the intention that you're gonna eat those apples or pears or, or cherries or whatever. If you let these things grow, they're going to take over because your tree is a little bit of a Frankenstein. It's grafted onto the tr thing. So you're grafted, you know, it's a little bit like having an artificial heart or something like that. It's not quite as good. You've got problems with graft compatibility with plants where it's, it's not recognizing it as itself. And sometimes this, I'm, I know I'm anthropomorphizing here, but sometimes this really frustrates the root system of the plant. And it's like, God, the only thing I'm getting is this little thing on top. I, 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 I'm not getting as much sugar as I want. If I can just push out my own shoots, I'll do better. And it will do better. Unfortunately, you won't get the fruit you're interested in. Um, so we care about suckers because if, we, if, it's, if it's coming up from the base of the tree below the, the graft union, and we let it go, it will basically grow much faster than the rest of the tree and it'll eventually shade it out and kill it. Um, and we don't want that fruit. So we, we have to keep track of that. Water sprouts are a different story. These come from the scion itself and certain trees like plums in particular produce these prodigiously, especially if they get over pruned once or twice, they remember that and they get really happy about sending up a lot of water sprouts. So that is the difference between water sprouts. The water sprouts are from the scion, suckers are from the rootstock. You'll hear people call water sprouts suckers a lot. 
it's not correct. I'm not saying you should go out and disabuse them of this notion. Just know that when they're talking about these things, you have to translate in your own head. Um, okay, fruit spurs. This is what I promised to start showing you, you know, what, it is, what these things are and, and what they're all about. So fruit spurs are these little short um, uh, twigs that come off of the main branch that produce this fruit. Now, on apricot um, and cherry, that's first year wood. So your fruit spurs are, are growing on this year's new, or actually it's last year's twig growth. And um, the, but the European pear and the Asian pear, they uh, only fruit on two year old wood. So they're gonna be um, grow, they're gonna be fruiting on these spurs that are much lower on the tree, not out at the very tips of the branches. Um, so you need to know where your fruits, if you're gonna do winter pruning, you need to know where your fruit um, is gonna be coming from because if you prune all the wrong stuff, you're gonna be in a world of hurt. Now that, in all fairness, the two one-year-old wood examples I have up here are apricot and cherry, and those should not be pruned in the winter at all in Marin because of a disease called Eutypha, and we'll get into that. So maybe I need to pick different examples and put some peaches up here or something like that. Peaches fruit on one-year-old wood. They don't get Eutypha like apricot and cherry do, so you can prune them in the winter. But you, since they fruit on one-year-old wood, you're not going to want to prune them much because every branch tip you take off is going to be that much less um, fruit you're going to get. So here's peach fruiting branches. This is just one-year-old wood. You can see their branch, they're fruiting, they're flowering and fruiting at the very tips of the branches. And you can even see the difference between the flower buds and the vegetative buds on the slide on the right. I keep wanting to use my po uh, the, the laser pointer and it's absolutely useless here. Um, so the vegetative bud is in the middle and the flower buds are much larger and they're big and swollen and they're on the outside. So that's where all the action's gonna be um, happening. And you can see what I'm talking about on the picture on the right. The two-year-old wood um, has uh, no flowers on it at all. It's only flowering on, that, on the, the last year's wood, that's it. Okay, so choosing and handling trees. Um, there are a number of reasons to pick bare root trees. They are um, cheaper than potted trees. Um, and you can see their root structure. And one of the problems we've been having with, particularly in say the last 10 years uh, with potted, uh, you know, container grown trees um, is that the, they have a lot of root defects in them. Um, and I'm not saying necessarily every tree is gonna have root defects, um, not that. But it ha it's happening often enough that now, uh, I'm starting to recommend that even if you buy a potted tree, you rinse all the soil off of the tree before you plant it and me make sure it doesn't have any circling roots or totally messed up root structure at the bottom because there have been a lot of problems with, and we used to not have these kinds of problems with getting quality nursery stock, but we are having problems with it now. Um, and so you need to be able to see the, the, the structure of the, the, the roots of the tree that you're planting. Um, because if it's got circling roots, it, it's gonna, it's, you can plant the tree, but it's gonna sort of be doomed. And when I'm talking about circling roots, I'm saying that Maybe when it was planted in a one gallon container, you know, it's not a very big container. So a one gallon container might only have, a, might only be about this big. And if the roots are circling there, as the tree tries to grow out, it's gonna get strangled by its own root system unless you cut those roots before the tree goes in the ground. Um, this is often not caught at nurseries anymore. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to prevent. Um, so if you order, trees in the dormant season, I would encourage you to get bare root trees if you can. Uh, they're not available for citrus, for instance, so you're just going to have to grow citrus from whatever you get, and then you're going to want to wash the soil off of it before you plant it to check it. Bare root trees, you want to get something that's pretty small, half inch to five eighths inch. Um, uh, you don't want to let your bare root trees uh, dry out 
So there's a number of ways you can store them if you're not ready to plant them just yet. Now, this is really mostly in an area where you might, um, if you're wanting to, if it's been really warm in February and you don't want to plant them just yet, you can keep them in your garage. Someplace cool and dark is, is preferable. If you got to keep them outside, um, you can heal them in, which is what this guy's doing here. A lot of the plant hormones apparently flow via gravity. And if you can turn the plant on its side, a lot of the plant hormones telling the plant, you sort of cause the plant to go on, um, uh, uh, hold its breath, if you will, or, or go into a sort of a comatose state. It just stops developing if it's on its side for a while when it's dormant. So the idea here is that you lean the trees over about 45 degrees or more, and you just cover their root systems with moist soil so that they stay, so they don't dry out, because they can dry out if they're, especially if you keep them in the house, that kind of thing. And they, they're not going to wake up just yet. And you can keep these trees for quite a while until, you know, the, the warm weather or the freezing weather or whatever is, is done. And then um, you can bring them back up. Now, in most areas of Marin, this is not something you really need to worry about. You can probably just put your bare root trees straight in the soil because they're not going to, um, the, the risks to the tree of them coming out of dormancy too early are minimal because uh, we just don't get that much frost. And most of the trees require a fair number of chill hours before they wake up anyway. Um, okay, so this is what we're, um, trying to do. You want to check your roots and cut off any dead or damaged or um, circling roots. You want your hole to be wide. Um, and it can be deep if the soil is compacted, but then you need to backfill with native soil, no amendments, and just tamp it down enough to get uh, to, to support the tree. You don't want to leave big air pockets. Um, if you need to plant, if you're in an area that's is prone to flooding or doesn't drain well, then you can plant on a mound to help keep the plant, uh, the crown dry, because the root crown is where a lot of oxygen ex change occurs. And if they stay too wet for too long, it can kill them. That said, I know all the Central Valley farmers um, are fond of using um, flood irrigation. It, there's a lot of reasons they use flood irrigation. As long as you don't keep it for weeks, it can do just fine. Um, plants can handle a little bit of flooding, particularly pears. And the reason the Central Valley farmers are doing it is because gophers love Central Valley farm soil. So if you flood that orchard for a couple weeks during the, um, uh, the wet season, or even a, a few days, that takes care of the gophers for the year. Um, so if you need to, you plant high because it reduces the ch chances of crown and root rot. You want your, um, your upper roots just below the uh, ground. You want your graft union, which isn't illustrated here, uh, to be well above soil. And you want to allow for soil settling, if, especially if you had to dig down and break up a compacted soil layer. You re backfilled it just with the native soil, but there is some settling that's going to occur. So then you absolutely want to make sure you plant high enough. Um, okay, so the point here is back to my dentist story. You know, he was like, you know, you said to just dig a shallow hole. Well, I wanted to do better than that. So he dug, literally he dug like five foot deep holes for every one of his food trees. And then I told him not to backfill and he was like, but backfill, but amendment, soil amendment's good. I read that it's good for plants. So he backfilled with soil amendment in that five foot hole. What do you think happened? A year later. I know you can't talk. Um, so, and a bunch of you guys are saying, well, all of the organic matter in his soil amendment broke down and the trees sank. Yeah, you're right. That's exactly what happened. And then the trees, as they sank, all the water flowed into that hole and it became a giant swimming pool and the trees started dying. So then we had to go back and dig all the damn trees out of the soil again and repot them the way I told them to do the first time. Um, so don't do that. Here's a great way of telling where you are on your, um, when you're planting. That board is sitting on the soil surface. So that shows, so the bottom of the board represents the planting hole, uh, sorry, the, the soil height outside of the planting hole. So that's, you want your root crown to be sitting a little bit above that height. So that's where it is. 
basically the tree in the picture is sitting just a little bit higher than the surrounding soil and that's exactly where you want it. Then you'll just pull it out of this container, shake a bunch of the soil off, put, uh, backfill as much as you can with native soil, check to make sure that it's still at the right height before you fill everything in and then you can go from there. This is the proper way to plant a tree. If it's a bare root, um, it gets a little more challenging in the sense of you don't have a container to be able to set these things up with, but you can still hold it in there and say, okay, is, it, is my root crown a little bit high? In the top picture on the left, you can see the root crown is at least right around the height of the soil. That's where you want that. In other words, where all those big roots come off of the trunk, that's, you want that at or above, slightly above soil grade. So you start by backfilling the soil around those roots and you know stepping on them a bit. You're not trying to compact the soil, you're just trying to firm it up so that the tree won't sink or fall over. And then you fill the rest of the way back up and you put your emitters out near where the edge of the root ball is. You do not want your emitters right next to the trunk. Um, and if you've got a plant with a particularly small root ball, you might have to put your emitters right next to the trunk for the first year only, but then you're going to have to move them. So plan for that when you're setting up your irrigation. So plant a con containerized tree. We've already sort of gotten a pretty good idea. This is basically what I'm saying. They're planting a peach in this case. I'm saying in this bottom left hand court where it says pull out circling roots, yeah, um, you're probably going to want to wash all the soil off that root ball and check that they did that when it was transplanted at the nursery from the one gallon to, this looks like it might even be, a, that's at least five, maybe 15. Um, you're going to want to make sure that that looks good. You don't, and then you're going to want to make sure, the other thing you want to make sure is that they, they didn't bury the root crown. That's another thing we're starting to see. The root crown could be, in that picture, the root crown could be two to three inches down. That's not good. If you're trying to plant high and they've planted it two, three inches down, you've already got a problem. Um, okay, so, but the, the, basically all the rest of the ideas are the same. It's pretty, now we're gonna get to the fun part. And this is where, so, so most of the, what we've covered so far are pretty much rules. You don't plant trees that don't have the right number of chill hours. You, you check uh, to make sure you've got a decent root system. You don't plant deep. You plant if any, at the right height. If anything, if you've got a question, plant a little bit high. Planting too high is just as bad as, you know, planting really high is just as bad as planting deep, unless you've got a mound system going and you're ready to maintain that. Um, but this is where things, the rules start getting easy to break, um, and, and maybe you should. Um, most people are uh, going to be going for, you can pick the structure that you want out of your tree. Different trees are going to be better suited for different structures. We're going to get into that right now. So what I'm plant, presenting here is just a typical post planting care for your typical tree, which is usually an open vase because most people don't want to climb ladders to harvest fruit. So if you're going to go for something where the, you've got the tree as this open vase structure, you're going to head the tree down, you know, anywhere between a foot and a half to three feet above grade. Um, you're going to want to cut back to well-placed laterals um, that are about three to eight inches apart, and you're going to remove all the others. You may want to trunk, paint the trunk white. This is pretty important, especially for really young saplings and cherries notoriously burn in Novato if you're going to plant a cherry. So will some other trees, but cherries are well known for it. If you plant cherries, you're going to have to whitewash. If you don't, the tree will sunburn in its first year and then it will get Pacific flat-headed borers that will come in and basically at that point, the tree may survive that, but at that point, the tree is going to be so damaged, it's going to take you years to get back to where you would have been if you'd whitewashed it. So whitewash it the first year. All the Central Valley farmers do this too. This is why all the trunks are painted white. It, and, and they keep doing it, even for some trees, because if they get too much sun on them, the graft union's particularly susceptible to burning and having problems there. Um, whitewash, if you can get it, is what you want to use because it breaks down into plant nutrients, which is calcium and um, uh, calcium carbonate, yeah. Um, and 
if you can't get whitewash, then you want to use interior latex paint and water, about a 50-50 ratio. Honestly, I dilute a little bit more. I find that works better for some of the plants that I've been working with in the Central Valley and um, the Sierra Foothills. I usually dilute it a little bit more like 60-40 because it'll get into some of those cracks and things better. And it still works just fine in terms of, um, of reflecting sun and keeping the bark temperatures cool so they don't sunburn. Um, you want to paint the entire trunk that is going to get exposed to sun and two inches below soil. Most of the time, once the tree flushes out with leaves, the top part of the trunk, the top part of the branches and things don't have to be painted because they're shaded by the canopy. But these young trees that come from the nurseries often have two or three, maybe even four feet of uh, open growth. And that has to be painted because it doesn't have enough foliage to shade it for the part of the day, particularly the late afternoon sun. Um, Okay, so what does it look like? For branches thinner, thinner than 3 16 on the left, this is what you're pruning back to. It's pretty harsh. If you've got branches that are a little thicker, you can keep some of the very first laterals. And you're starting to see about what we're talking about, radial spacing and, and vertical spacing. Um, so um, I know it looks horrible. See that 3 16 inch tree? Here it is growing out the next year. You've got plenty of uh, branches to choose from. You're going to pick a few scaffolding branches on this and grow from there. I'm not saying you have to prune it that brutally. Again, this is an open base. This is typical planting care for what most people do. We'll get into different forms of pruning in just a second. So on the left, you see the before. On the right, you see the after. This is for a larger tree that they decided to keep some scaffolding branches to prevent sunburn on the trunk. So, and that's a good idea. So, um, so they've, they've pruned it back, uh, they, and they're, you can see the lateral branches. They're not necessarily going to keep all those lateral branches. A lot of those are just temporary branches that they're maintaining for the time being to keep the trunk from sunburning and allow the tree to perform, you know, put up a little bit more of a canopy. And that's the idea. In the beginning, we're not trying to go for fruit. We're trying to get the tree to be, have the right structure and, the, and grow quickly soon. So this is Chuck Ingalls' um, beautiful new orchard that he established. You can see it doesn't look like much when you first put it in. Um, all the trunks are whitewashed, the whole tree, and uh, before, they, before they grow out. And most of them are just little tiny sticks. Um, and you'll notice that he's planted in some various different ways. On the left, I'm sorry, on the right, okay, let's go back. On the left are the normal spacings he's going to use for slightly larger trees. On the right, he's going to prune those into a fruit hedge. So he's planted really densely. And he will probably take out every other tree down the line anyway. OK, we've been talking for roughly an hour. Um, do you guys want to take a five minute break? Everybody stretch their legs. Um, does that work for you guys? That sounds good. OK, so um, I'm going to take. It's uh, 1035 right now. We'll reconvene at 1040 and let everybody go get a glass of water, do, use the bathroom, whatever they need to do. I'll talk to you guys in five. Sounds good, Stephen. Thank you. OK. Susan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do you hear me? Yeah. So listen, um, I would like when Stephen comes back, um, to ask him all the questions that people have chatted. Okay. okay sounds good. Yeah. No, there are quite a few questions. He starts I see. his presentation. I hear okay. yeah. you. Can you guys comes, take my picture off of here? Or maybe I can do that. Yeah, you can take your picture off. Hide self view. Is that it? Yes, thank you. Cool. We, but we like seeing you, Susie. Well, you didn't see me. You saw my name. Well, now I just see your name. No, it's gone totally, right? No, your name's yeah. up because you're talking, but I can't see you. Oh, I don't see where my name is up, but I'm going to shut up now. So I, in fact, <laughs> I'm going to mute myself. I'm here if you guys want to ask the questions. 
Oh yeah, I have, but people may be taking a break, Stephen, so let them take a break. Oh, and, and then we're that come break, back. Um, I have a bunch of questions that they've chatted that they would like answered. So, sounds good. So I'm gonna go grab an orange then real quick. Go ahead. Okay. Susan, I still don't know what happened to my desktop. I had I had them opened and they were not available when I had with that little list that they give you, you know. Right. I don't I don't get it. I, I just I must have just clicked something wrong. Very frustrating. Okay, we're just learning. I know. Well, thank you for backing me up. That's what partners are for. <laughs> It's just, I, I just, I just can't imagine here. I had all these things lined up on my desktop, opened them up and, and now I, they're, they're either hiding from me some way, somehow, or, or what, I just need to practice with it a little bit more. Well, we have all week to get ready for next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, it's 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 really amazing that this thing is is there though. What a what a way to finish up the class. It's really cool. And you know, everybody in class can hear us. Yeah, that I know. I know. <laughs> so let's not talk about them too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's one thing about these kind of systems. You do have to remember that now I can't see anybody's picture right now so I'm not sure what I did to cause that to happen you're on speaker view speaker view can you see me when I'm talking no no so let me um so I, I can see uh let's see let me see if I can see get my yeah now I can see you I had I had find my little uh, my little uh controls Now there you are, yeah. yeah. It looks like people are taking breaks, which is good. Yeah, I might do the same, for, and then I'll be back in about two minutes. Take, take a break. Hi, Susan. Hi, Anne-Marie, how are you doing? I'm doing well. This is very interesting. This whole Zoom thing. It is very interesting. We're all learning together. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I do, I was really liking the classroom. I liked the classroom. And um, this is different, I guess, because we're being so restricted outside too. You know, so we're here. Yeah, you know, if it weren't for the restrictions, we'd still be in class, but we really need to follow the rules and keep everybody healthy. Oh, I understand. I wouldn't want, no, I wouldn't be going to class even if you said go, because that's true. I think we do have to keep the distance. Yeah, so, you know, we're doing the best that we can do given the circumstances. And, and it's really, great. And we really appreciate everybody's flexibility and patience with us. Well, we all had to learn this. Yep. So it's fine. So we just turn in our project after this? Um, next, you, next on April 2nd, you email GPPF. We'll go over that this afternoon. Okay. Well, actually, this morning when Stephen's done, because there's no afternoon class. We're trying to, sitting down in front of a computer screen, watching a dry lecture, you know, without the class interaction is, is trying. It's hard on him too, I think. Susan? I, I think it's very hard, yeah. So are you saying we have to email our GPPs to you? Just GPPG, the last one. Oh, okay, okay, good. We're not gonna have to figure out how to upload yeah. the whole thing? Okay, I was no. like, ah! No, we're just trying to keep it um, as simple as we possibly can, Isabel. Yeah. And so you guys will just email us the GPP, the last GPP, and we will email it to the GPPTAs who will go over them and then email them back to you. Okay. So basically we are on total um, email or Zoom or virtual reality right now. Yeah. And then we get the famous final. 
you get the final next week. It's not that hard. It's like doing homework, Anna Maria. That's all it's like. It's doing homework. That's why we canceled the homeworks. We're trying to make it easier. We're giving you an extra week to do the final. So you have four weeks of open book. Then how to do it. You'll have plenty of time. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. Got it. It's, it, it just takes time. And you definitely don't want to procrastinate, though. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I gave up that a long time ago. And then there's Rod Kerr, the, our co-president. He did it in 24 hours. Stayed up straight and decided You're he was kidding. Good. Yeah, it's an amazing story. I don't see how in the world he did it. He said he just stayed up for 24 hours and did the final. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Are we ready to start? So are P let's see if people are back. Let me look at my gallery view here. It looks like people are still. I think we have a few more minutes. Oh, Did, do we? Didn't you say? Um, can we can give them? Can we give them a few more, three more minutes, Stephen? Yeah. I'm not. I got nothing else going on. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> Susan, I came back while you were describing the homework. Uh, you know, uh, uh, new new situation and GPPs. Can yeah. you uh, go over that? Yeah, we'll go over it after Stephen's done again, Emery. But basically, um, we're just going to okay. have people email in GPPG next week. Not the whole GPP project, just your last GPP assignment. We're okay. just trying to keep it simple. Okay, thank you. Thank and you very much. You are all going to pass your finals. You're all going to become certified master gardeners. And hopefully a year from now, everybody's going to be healthy. Their families are going to be healthy. And we will be cracking up about doing class on Zoom. Yes, I think that's a good plan. So, and this way nobody has to take a shower before class or get dressed up before class. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just, yeah, that, that's a good thing. I'm just curious, does anyone know anyone who's ill with the virus? I'm just curious how, I don't know. I, none of my close friends or family have, have gotten it. I don't know of anyone. No, I don't know anyone. My, my friend's mom um, has it. She was on the cruise. Um, oh. so didn't I read? My, my niece is in San Francisco and she has it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, my I have a partner has three daughters have it in three different parts of the country. Oh. Whose daughters? Yours? No. No, a, a very good close friend. She has grown daughters. And all three of them have it. Oh. One lives in New York, one lives in Chicago, and one lives in Idaho. Wow. Were they all together? No. Just no. all separate. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. Sounds like the next couple of weeks are going to be pretty rocky. It yeah. does. It does. How, how are all of you moms doing with younger children at home? Going a little crazy. I'm not, not a mom. <laughs> <laughs> it is what, what pretty what intense. Mean, mom? <laughs> Moms and dads. Moms and dads. That's right. We got some dads in the middle of it. Yes. Well, we're we've all. I'm also. I teach music to kids zero to five and their families, and we've been kind of doing this whole Zoom thing to good effect. I think it helps everybody feel still connected and. Oh, that's so nice. There's a community. <laughs> yeah. My little one is not here yet, so I don't know. <laughs> Missing the party. Yeah. <laughs> and then there are those of us whose adult children have moved back home. Yeah. Mine have not, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, a, you know, my son is doing his last quarter of college living back home. Oh boy. <laughs> and graduation has been canceled. Yeah, oh. it's, it's hard. 
all yeah. my grown kids moved home the first week. They, the, they, not all of them, one of them is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but the, the two others did. I think it was just everybody was so nervous and it just felt better to be at home. But now they've gone back to their apartments in the city. Okay, nice. So Stephen, are you ready for some questions? Sure, let's, can you okay. hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> Your two hours have to be consecutive or consistent. You said that if temperatures get high in the middle of the chill per period, do the chill hours need to reset? So they don't have to be consecutive. Um, in fact, they aren't going to be consecutive because so as the daily temperatures rise above 45 degrees, the tr tree will stop accumulating chill hours. Um, and then as the night temperatures drop back down below 45 degrees, it'll start ticking up again and it'll just keep going. Everything's fine with it just getting um, little bits of chill hours as the whole winter progresses, because otherwise it's going to be really hard to get 400 straight chill, out, chill hours below 45 degrees. It's, it, it's going to be very challenging in some place like Marin. But um, it's only when you get above about 70 degrees that they start rolling backwards. Uh, and, and so then, yeah, the chill hours in some sort of sense do have to be a little consecutive. Um, not necessarily. For instance, if we take this last February, if you had accumulated 150 chill hours and then we got some warm temperatures, it might have rolled back the chill hours by 20 or 30 chill hours and then it gets cold again like it just did this morning. Um, we will start seeing chill hours start racking back up. Of course, since it rolled it back, you're not starting from 150 anymore. You're now starting more like from 110 and then you're going back up from there. And as long as you get to 400 by the end of, um, by the time the tree actually sets fruit, you're fine. I'm so, not sets fruit, set, begins to break bud on flowers, you're fine. Um, so my numbers were way off because 150 is very, very low. We should be, by this time of year in Marin, we should be sitting at somewhere between four to 600. Um, so, but it was illustration purposes only. You get what I'm trying to say, I hope. Got it. Question number two, how do you know how many chill hours you need when, when the rootstock has multiple graphs of different species on it? One of the <laughs> species. If, well, what you really need then, if you've got multiple species, so I'm not a big fan of like the salad bowl trees, but, um, but you're, you need to find out what every varietal that's been grooved, uh, grafted onto it is and take the varietal with the highest number of chill hours. Realistically, most, if they did the tree well, most of the fruit, um, the, the varietals that'll be grafted onto it should have similar chill hour requirements because otherwise they're gonna be blooming and, and setting it fruit at very different times of the year. But I mean, it could, it could happen. Okay. Will the self-fruitful fruitful, fruitful varieties cross with anything, will they act as a pollinator, um, pollinizer for another um, tree? I don't believe they will cross with anything because typically their pollen, because they will uh, set seed, they'll be, they'll set fruit with their own pollen. Their own pollen is going to be the first thing that hits them. So they're not going to necessarily need, you'll never know whether or not, you know, they're going to do it. Because remember, the pollen only has to do with what's in the seed. The fruit is formed from the plant itself, not from any interaction with the pollen. The pollen is just used to make the plant understand, oh, I've got seeds, now I need to develop fruit. Boom, it develops fruit. So the pollen doesn't matter for what we're trying to get in terms of fruit. It just matters that we get fruit at all for some of the um, things. I don't know some of the um, varietals that are self-fruitful can be sterile because they're parthenocarpic, which is a term meaning they will set fruit even without fertilization. Um, that's true for some figs. Um, I don't know about all the apple varietals. If they're parthenocarpic, then they don't, they, then they may be sterile. You'll need to check in with your, um, 
you'll need to check in on your with your nursery to figure out what how that's going to function in your um in your garden Does okay so so they wouldn't be a pollinizer then or you don't it depends on you don't know that you'd have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis it would depend upon whether it's a parthenocarpic tree that doesn't have to actually set fruit if it's a sterile parthenocarpic tree then it will not act as a part of pollinizer if it's just self-pollinizing then it could act as a pollinizer does that make sense yeah. as long as, as long as it's compatible with the other tree so you're just gonna have to look this up on a case-by-case -case basis does that okay. make sense yes that that does make sense hold on a second i'm going back to another question um do spurs grow back if they've been cut off? Um, oh, hang on two seconds. Um, yeah, this, there, in most cases, yes, as long as you have not cut it all the way back to the, the, the main branch. If you just, so there is something that's called spur reinvigoration that some orchardists practice where they will snip about they will snip some of the spur off to, because it's stopped producing so much and that will uh, get it to produce new first year wood. And then the year after that, it will set new um, flower buds. And spurs tend to stay spurs. So as long as you don't remove the entire spur, it'll stay a spur, Does, is this, it'll stay a spur and you can invigorate it that way. If you remove the entire spur, then you may get another branch coming off. It may be a whip, it may not be a fruiting spur. There's no way to know. Um, it'll, it'll probably tend to be a fruiting spur. Most of your whips and shoots are gonna be at, um, sorry, whip and shoot are the same. I, I'm using those interchangeably. Those are gonna be at the branch tips typically. So yeah, your, your spur may grow back, but I can't, it's not a guarantee. It depends upon how it's pruned. Okay, so if you cut the roots um, of a new fruit tree to avoid the circling roots, does it hurt the tree? Oh, absolutely. But the, the, the transplanting the tree hurts the tree. Pruning the tree at any point in time hurts the tree. Fruit trees have been bred to be abused. Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry for, to say that, but uh, they need, they, so you're going to abuse the tree and you're much better off removing a few roots. Yes, it's going to hurt the tree. Then you are leaving that circling root to slowly strangle it later in life. Um, the tree can handle a few uh, cut roots. What it can't handle is that circling root. So it's by far the lesser of two evils. For fruit trees that are planted improperly too low, and none of us have ever done that before, is there anything that we can do to correct this? If the tree's grown in and it's rather large, then obviously you didn't plant it so low that it killed it, so you're probably okay. Um, if it's small and you catch it before the tree's dead, yeah, you can dig the tree back up, replant it the, the correct way, and, um, and you'll be better off in the long run. Um, I realize there's some gray area between large and small, where it's going to be a real challenge to dig up and it is too low and you're just worried you haven't gotten that really wet heavy year that's going to drown it yet um and you know that's going to in some cases it may be less effort to simply go out and take out that tree and buy another one than it is going to be to dig the whole thing up and try and replant it. okay can you plant a fruit tree on a slope absolutely it gets a little harder because um, a lot of a lot of good orchards are on slopes, usually fairly mild slopes. But um, slopes are good; they provide drainage there. And as long as you've got the topsoil for it, good. The problem with slopes is they typically don't have really deep topsoil, so it's. Um, but they ha they have other, and, and the other problem with slopes is particularly if you've got a high chill hour fruit tree, slopes tend to stay warmer than valley bottoms. So you may not be able to, even though you, it says in, your, in the area that you get X number of um, chill hours, if you're high on a slope, you may not get the same chill hours that you would get even just a few hundred feet away at the valley bottom. So you may have some challenges with chill hours. 
it can just be a little more challenging. It doesn't mean you can't grow. It just means you might choose a different varietal and you might have to uh, uh, care for it differently. If you have a tall fruit tree that you want to prune down, how much height can you prune? That is a very challenging question. Probably not something we can, that has to be looked at on a case by case basis and it depends upon the structure of the tree. Um, you can whack things and be brutal with your pruning, but it ge generally drastically shortens the life of the tree. Maybe you don't care. I mean, I'm not trying to be, I'm not holding trees up as this precious thing. Fruit trees in particular, I mean, in the orchard industry, they get, even if, even if the trees are in good shape, sometimes fruit goes out of fashion. Like how many people have seen yellow delicious apples anytime in the last 20 years in um, in a, in, at the grocery store. I mean, they're really, really rare. And you used to be able to find yellow delicious or golden delicious, sorry. And, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you could find golden delicious. They just don't keep well and they went out of favor. And now even if you've got an entire orchard full of perfectly good golden delicious apples, nobody will buy them. So they, most orchards are run on a 30 year cycle where they're planning on ripping the trees out after 30 years, even if they're healthy because the um, the trees, the fruit's not in fashion anymore. So I guess what I'm trying to say is with this whole idea, don't, I'm not trying to be too kind to fruit trees. They're there to produce fruit and that's the main thing. So if you have to make big ugly cuts, make big ugly cuts, but understand that fruit trees don't grow. If it's gotten too big, that's an old tree and that, it is not going to grow fast enough to close those wounds and you are basically shortening that tree's life pretty drastically. Mm -hmm. You can get another five or ten years out of it and maybe that's all you care about but that is the end of it for the tree. It will not close the wounds in time. And if you want to see it, um, the Sonoma County has some cherries that were pruned too severely a number of years ago. They all have split gill um, in them now and they're all going to go in the next year or two. Uh -huh. Hey, is there a website that lists pollinizer plants like you had for cherries? I don't know. Um, I think so. I think the home orchard has a lot of that stuff. If not, there are other, um, so Dave Wilson Nurseries is one of the last fruit tree growers and developers in, Cal in California, certainly. I think they are the last in California. And they're one of the last in the United States, but they know their fruit tree varietals and they can provide you with the information you need. So, um, and we have a number of orchard advisors in California that might be able to help us. Most of them are working in like um, almonds and walnuts and, uh, and that kind of thing. But they're, and we used to have Chuck Ingalls who we could ask all the fruit tree questions. But if you can't find it, um, at, on the, um, the home orchard or that kind of thing, uh, or it, actually the home orchard is the place to go. Um, come talk to me and we can try, see if we can hunt it down. I also believe that Dave Wilson really um, has a great website for that because I've used it. Yeah. Okay, why aren't you a fan of fruit cocktail trees? Um, so um, if they're cared for properly, they can, be decent trees. Uh, the problem is often that there are issues with graft incompatibility and you've now made four or six different grafts onto a single tree and some of those grafts are going to perform better than others. So now you have to keep track of which grafts are doing well, which grafts are which kind. There are a lot of work. That's, I guess that's all I'm trying to say. If you've got a really limited yard and you want a number of different um, you want all those different plums or you want all those different cherries, or you want all those different apples, great, no problem. But what typically happens is the trees get forgotten about a bunch of the different grafts either fail or get diseased and then they end up performing not nearly as well as a tree that wasn't a fruit cocktail tree in the first place. Uh, it's it's a personal choice and you, you know horses for courses if that's that's what you can put in and you like it and you're willing to put the work in great no problem i have no problem with other people having fruit cocktail trees it's just okay. not um 
Will Lappins or Stella pollinize Bing or Rainier? I don't know. We'd have to go back. Let's try that. It's in here someplace. There you go. Bing will not be uh, pollinized by Lapin, and it, and Stella. Oh, you're asking asking if Lapin or Stella be pollinized by Bing or Rainier. It doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, they could potentially be pollinized. We'll never know because the fruit isn't any different when you cross. I mean, Lapin fruit is Lapin fruit. Stella fruit is Stella fruit. If it's pollinized by Lapin and, or Stella, which are so fruitful, that's the most likely pollinizer. If they're pollinized by Bing or Rainier, you'll never know by looking at the fruit. You just get the fruit. That's all you know. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, thank you. Those are the questions for now. We're back, you're back at it. Okay, now, if I can only remember where I was. There. There? Oh, yeah, we were looking at Chuck's new orchard. There we go. Okay, so, so this is Chuck's new orchard. And what he was doing with these trees on the right hand side of the screen um, that you can see that are all planted really closely is he was going for um, these fruit, this fruit hedge he was calling for. You'll notice they're not nearly as dense as they once were. He planted them a little um, perhaps too closely. So he has pruned these down to just a V shape. That's what he was aiming for with them. And having them all really close together meant that it was just one solid area and he gets a lot of fruit out of this hedge that acts a little bit as a screen too. So anyway, that's um, the idea behind the, the fruit hedge that, he, that Chuck was a big fan of. Um, and then this is our open, uh, open vase tree at the, on the left hand side, just standard stuff. So um, that's what you're aiming for. So post planting irrigation. So you got to water the trees in after planting because the root si systems, even if the tree is not in leaf, the root systems still have to be in moist soil. If they're not moist, they will dry out because they are respiring. Um, so they, you know, they're burning, well, they're losing water while just sitting there. Um, not a lot, but a little. So. If it's in a heavy soil and the soil is already wet, then you don't water because the risk that you have is that the um, roots go anaerobic. So when water is in heavy soils like clay soils, it, there's not very much air in there. And the roots on fruit trees have to breathe. And a lot of that respiration takes place at the root crown, but not all of it. And so um, if you put them in, in basically mud, they will drown and and it will um and it can kill them so don't water if the soil is already moist uh especially in heavy soils um drip emitters should be one to three away from feet away from the trunk or a donut basin around the base of the tree um drip and micro sprinkler irrigation are considered best partly for just efficiency's sake um but um Furrow works, donut rings work, sprinklers can work. Sprinklers have the problem of getting a lot of water up into the canopies when the tree is in leaf, and that can cause some disease problems. So that's not preferred. The worst though is in a lawn, which are because sprinklers for fruit trees would only have to be run once a week or maybe not even that. A lawn generally needs multiple irrigations in a week, and that's where you really get disease issues going. Not just foliar disease issues, but root disease issues too, because the soil stay warm and moist all the time. And that's not um, what they really want to be doing. So when we're watering, the water should reach at least two feet deep. I don't know anybody that actually digs a two foot hole to make sure that the water is getting that deep down. So most of the time you just use a soil probe or a shovel and you check that it's still moist at one foot deep and you're probably fine. 
Um, I don't know where these two foot recommendations come from. Um, and then please understand that the water needs of your plants are going to change over time. So a small tree, one to two years old, will use about two gallons a day. Now, I'm not talking they'll be using two gallons a day now. I'm saying they'll be using maybe up to two gallons a day in the peak of water use, which is in early July. Um, you know, on a warm summer day, they'll use about two gallons of water. A mature tree will use more than 50 gallons of water a day, peak irrigation. Um, that doesn't mean you have to supply more than 50 gallons because a mature tree hopefully is tapped into some water source that it can use on its own. So that's what it needs to survive. You may have, you're going to have to figure out what you need to supply out of that. And the way you do that is by testing your soil, mostly in July, using a soil probe saying, gosh, it's pretty dry, even 10 inches down. Maybe it's time for me to water because if the tree had a lot of water, it shouldn't be dry 10 inches down. We can get into exactly why that is later. I'm happy to discuss, you know, um, well, okay, actually we'll talk about it very briefly now. Remember that free trees like any other tree have to trade with, um, they don't have to, they prefer to trade with fungi, mycorrhizal fungi. These are fungi that make um, associations with the roots and the tree wants these. In fact, a lot of trees can't survive without them. They, the, the, the mycorrhizae get coated on their seed coats and, and they fall into soils that have these things because that's where they grow in forests with other fruit trees around. Um, and so the mycorrhizae are already there. When a seedling sprouts out, the col roots colonized by the fungus almost immediately and the, the, the tree sprouts and supplies sugars to the roots in the form of sugar water and the roots supply all the nutrients because fungi are really good at breaking down dead leaves and dead bugs and all the other stuff you can and phosphorus deposits in the soil and so they're good at gathering all that stuff and every day the tree um, photosynthesizes and every night the tree has water and it's got sugar and it sends water down through its roots and feeds these fungi. The fungi then take the sugar water and take all the sugar. The water they use to exude, even in dry soils, the fungi will still work because the tree is bringing up water from deeper in the soil and supplying it to the fungi. That's why in California, even if it hasn't rained in two months, if you dig down around oaks and things like that, you will find water, the soil's kind of moist and, and damp at down at, at 10 inches, 12 inches. And if the tree has enough water, you'll be able to tell because the soil will be moist around the tree's root systems. Um, the same thing's happening here. A mature tree uses 50 gallons a day. If it doesn't have, if it's not moist around the tree's root system, particularly, you know, the small feeder roots, you know the tree's pretty much out of water. So then you do need to start supplying it. So that's how you check the water. And you should check it in midsummer when water use is the highest and know that that's how much water you need to supply your trees when things are dry and warm. And then you can taper off from there toward the fall because as the day lengths get shorter, the tree will need less and less and less water because day length is the single greatest predictor of what, uh, the single greatest driver of water use. Yes, a warm, hot, windy day may be short and the tree may actually use more water, but that's three factors that you're putting all together that trump uh, uh, day length as the thing. Generally speaking, water use pretty closely follows day length. Okay, so that's why we're, how we're dealing with tree water. Drip irrigation um, on bare soil looks like this. So it tends to flow not just straight down, but laterally. The heavier the soil is, the wider it will spread. Um, one of the good reasons we like mulch around the base of these trees is it helps. So this is, you know, that's bare soil on the top and the bottom picture is all those little feeder roots right around that drip emitter finding it when you cover your lines with mulch. It not only helps keep the lines protected, keeps the water cooler because you don't want warm water out there, but it allows the roots to get right up where the water is and get it. Micro sprinklers work pretty much the same way. They can be very water efficient compared to high, um, high pressure sprinklers like the rainbirds that you are used to seeing. I'm not picking on rainbird. Rainbird makes micro sprinklers too. I'm just thinking of the big ones that you used to see. Um, 
These are actually preferred by some people, uh, especially if you can set them off in the morning when evaporation rates are pretty low. Fertilization. Most fruit trees really don't need much in the way of fertilization. Um, very little nitrogen is required. Generally speaking, if you put nitrogen on, it causes a lot of leaf growth at the expense of fruit growth. And that's not always what you want to do. So use no more than one pound of nitrogen per year, if any. Um, too much nitrogen, it results in excessive growth and the shading of lower wood. Um, and in California, for the most part, other nutrients are usually sufficient. You don't need to add potassium and phosphorus to your soils. Most California soils have plenty of phosphorus, but if you live in Tiburon, so you have serpentine soils, all bets are off. Um, so, uh, and, and that's true even, we have certain strains of serpentine going through Novato and other parts of Marin too. Um, it's California state soil. It's all messed up in terms of nutrient availability. So if you have, are struggling, do a, um, a, a so, send, pay for a soils test, figure out what's going on with your soils, and that'll help you really uh, dial in exactly what you need to do to get things right. Um, and then, you know, the one good thing here is even if you're on a pretty lousy soil that's got nutrients imbalances, organic um, composts and amendments are usually very balanced and they've got a lot of micronutrients in them too. So if you just apply those on a fairly consistent basis, you're almost guaranteed that's going to be pointing your tree in the right direction. It may not take care of all the nutrient imbalances that are potentially out there, but it's at least going to help a whole lot more than just putting in NPK. Um, so, you know, these are, these are what I'm talking about in pruning and what I'm talking about with fertilization. These are general guidelines. Again, if you're on serpentine, you probably, it would behoove you to take a test because you may have to fertilize in order to get your trees to go. Um, so just realize these are rules of thumb. So let's talk about the basics of pruning real quick. Um, all of your trees should look like this. Um, remove the, we're going to talk about cuts. I'm pretty sure you guys all are familiar with the different kinds of cuts we can make. Um, the idea is that a heading cut removes a uh, part of a branch or shoot. Um, not necessarily to, it's, it's a cut made in the middle of it, not at a branch junction. So it's used to promote branch development, especially on young trees. Um, but in my book, most of the time you need to know why you're making a heading cut, if you're making a heading cut. There are times and good reasons, but heading cuts are not the preferred cut. Um, if you make your two, tree too thick with these, it can reduce sunlight penetration, get, get in the way of fruit production. So let's look at some tree responses um, to the heading cut. So what the different, these lines, these dotted lines you're seeing in the picture are the um, bud scale scars from different previous year's growth. So if we cut into second year growth, so as you can see on the left hand side, the, all the growth is there and the first year growth is just a straight um, shoot uh, um, at the very end. And all of these are cutting into second year growth and you're looking at the differential um, plant responses. I'm sorry, the last one, image D, is cutting into third year growth. Um, you can see all the different plant responses to, um, to, to your cuts. So in image B, you have a very mild cut and it is allowed the um, last two or three branches to be stimulated. Uh, those last two or three buds that were dormant have now been stimulated to grow because you took off that, um, that, that the leader on, in A. And all three of them have been stimulated, but they're not growing as big as they are in image C. Where we've cut to C, we've only left those three branches. So the way you can kind of think about this is in image A, the tree has already allocated as much um, growth as it's going to put into that branch in the beginning year. And, and so it's doing the same thing in image B and C. It still has that same amount of growth that it's going to be, that's, that it's sort of programmed into itself. And that programming happens in the summer. So image A 
it's just going to grow as much as it's going to grow. And image B, since it's lost all that top, it's like, oh, I'm going to grow back hard. So it puts out a bunch of new growth. And image C, that all that growth is put into, and it's in image B, I'm sorry, in image B, all the growth goes into those three ends. And image, but the, you'll see in image B, the three bottom ones that are still dormant, they're still going to leaf out. They'll probably form fruiting spur. In image C, now that we've cut everything away except those last three, what would have become fruiting spurs now become shoots. And the tree, because the tree really, really wants to grow out of those, um, out of those last three buds, because those are the only three buds it's got left, and it's dedicated all its energy going into those. Once we cut back out of second year wood into third year wood, we are stimulating the branches, but it's not as much stimulation as we got in ABC. So pruning fruit trees gets complicated pretty quickly, and we can't possibly cover all of it. But this is the idea that when you prune a tree, it stimulates growth in different ways. I, I'm sorry, when you do winter dormant pruning of trees, it stimulates growth in different ways. When you summer prune, most of these effects don't happen as nearly as severely. That's because the tree is still programming itself in summer. And when you start cutting these branches in summer, the tree can adjust for it and, and changes how it's going to respond that next winter. And these effects are not nearly as pronounced. And that's one of the reasons orchardists use winter pruning, because they know what kind of effects you can get really strong effects with winter pruning. Maybe you don't want really strong effects, in which case maybe you should do summer pruning. Um, but that's why people are doing, and the other reason people are pruning in winter is obviously there's a lot less foliage on the tree, so it's a lot easier to see what you're doing um, in terms of the overall tree structure. But that's about as far as we're going to go into, you know, how to prune today, because really we could spend an entire weekend on a class on this um, at some point. Okay, so that is a heading cut. These are thinning cuts. This is when you're removing an entire branch or shoot. So this is what I was talking a little bit about when we were saying if you remove the, sh the uh, fruiting spur entirely, if you made a thinning cut, then you will simply, the tree will often just heap a close, close the wound over and you will have nothing left there. Um, it's only a thinning cut if you remove to something large enough to take over. So in this example that we see on the right, if that shoot going up to the left that we see in the picture was a tiny little whip and it wasn't anywhere near the third of the diameter of the main branch, that would still be considered a heading cut because that little whip won't be enough to take over the job that this whole branch had done um, or that whole branch had done. But um, it, it is bigger than a third of the thing. It's almost half the size of that um, trunk diameter, or it is half the sum of that branch diameter. So it's going to do a fine job of taking over, and the tree will probably put out a few little sprouts there, but the, the um, remaining branch will be the new leader on that branch. So thinning cuts are used to keep a little bit more of a natural look, prevent crowding, and improve sunlight penetration. And this is how you define the structure of the tree, is by removing the branches that you don't necessarily want. So there's other considerations that go into whether you keep a branch or not. One of them is what the, does the attachment to the tree look like? The narrower the angle gets, the weaker the connection tends to be between the branch and the trunk. So on the left, we have what's labeled bad. Um, and you can see that as the trunk is as the trunk and branch have grown next to each other, there's bark been trapped in between it. And there's no connective tissue forming between the trunk and the branch, except really far down. This makes the branch very weak and very prone to failure. Because as you can imagine, most of the growth on that branch on the left-hand side of the screen is out to the right. Because the, it it's going to be competing with the main trunk if it grows to the, if the branches are going to go to the left. So this branch that's coming off to the right is going to lean to the right, and have most of its foliage on the right, and that's going to put all the weight to the right, and it's going to make it want to tear out. Um, it's much better for the tree when you have a situation like we see in the right hand picture labeled good, where that branch is pretty wide that that and there's plenty of connection connected to sorry i meant to say the angle is pretty wide 
and there's plenty of connective tissue between the branch and the main trunk. So let's look at a couple, we'll get to more of this in an example. But if you've got a young tree and you're trying to train it to have good fruit production and good branch angles, you can use even little things on, um, uh, on a young tree, just putting a, a clothespin in there can pinch off, um, can, it's not, it, they're using it to sort of separate that, that branch and force it down, that, that branch that's going off to the upper, up and to the left, they're using that clothespin to push that, that little twig down. And if you can get it to stay there for a whole growing season like that, it'll, um, the wood will sort of fix in that position. Um, you can also do in the picture in the upper right, these branches are used for two things on this tree. They're being used to help support the trunk of a tree. And they're also being used to make sure that these branches don't grow straight up. Um, they're pulling them down a little bit and they're um, spreading that tree out so it has a good open base structure. That's one way of doing it. Those T posts can be rather challenging to put in and um, perhaps even more challenging to remove. My favorite is this picture we have down on the right, which is um, sort of using what you've got. These are prunings from other trees where they've kept a little bit of a, um, you've got a branch with a, a Y crotch at the end or a V and they're, um, and they've cut a little notch into the base of the branch and they're wedging these to uh, separate out the lateral branches so that they form nice wide junctions. This is gonna make the branches have good structure and it's gonna make them bear fruit better. So there's a good reason to do this kind of stuff. So summer versus winter pruning. Let's see, what are we doing on time? Okay, so um, trees are programmed, as I mentioned before, when they're in leaf during the summertime, they figure out how they're gonna allocate their resources. This, if you prune in the summer, it stops the growth at the cut where you make it and the tree can reprogram itself and then reallocate how it's gonna go, what it's gonna do next year. Winter pruning stimulates growth and it, the tree is already programmed, it can't readjust things now. So it stimulates the growth from the remaining buds and you can use that to help you control how the tree grows. Um, and that's when we are using heading cuts, uh, particularly to help sh uh, uh, shape the tree. But you're going to have to get to know your trees. They, different trees respond differently. Now, within varieties, they tend to be the same because varieties are clones, remember, of the original tree. So you're not going to get a lot of variation um, within variety, but you will get variation in, in responses between different varieties. And thinning cuts really don't do, they, they behave pretty much the same in winter as in summer. So thinning cuts are a little more, pre well, I mean, the reason we like to use heading cuts in winter is because they are fairly predictable in what they do. Um, thinning cuts are more predictable because they pretty much stop growth. Okay, so as we mentioned, um, one of the th big issues in Marin County in the last oh, 15 years or so now has been the arrival of Utypa. Utypa is a fatal disease. Um, it infects uh, apricots very frequently. Cherries a little less so, but it can infect cherries. Um, we do not prune cherries or apricots in Marin in the winter at all anymore. Um, we prune um, in the summer when we know there's going to be at least six weeks, and we never know, but we, when we predict there will be at least six weeks before the first rain. So that means you want to be getting your pruning done in August or early September, because um, if you get rains in late September, it might be a little too soon, but usually we get rain more like in October and we want six weeks for everything to heal up before, um, before the rains come because Utypa is spread in rain and it infects wounds. Um, and it takes a tree about eh, up to six weeks to close. Okay, summer pruning of young trees. Now, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly um, because Chuck was a big fan of having fruit bushes and fruit hedges. He really liked fruit, fruit trees that were six feet or less in height. And even dwarf, dwarfing uh, varietals don't always get stay that small. So his idea was to just prune the heck out of it, but he liked pruning. And you're to do some of this summer thinning that he's gonna show here, 
you are going to have to prune three or four times a summer potentially. And you're going to have to whitewash because you're going to expose branches that were not pre that used to be shaded and they are going to be susceptible to sunburn, especially cherries. So um, the summer pruning of young trees though is really good. It from it's used to create the scaffolding and structure. You thin unwanted sh shoots, um, or you can head them to four to six inches and make them temporary shoots. Um, and you will possibly have to whitewash. So um, to, the idea of summer pruning is to increase sunlight um, to the lower wood and get the better fruiting out of it. Uh, you get rid of some of the unwanted, super vigorous upright trees because you're really going for fruit. Fruit, but again, one to three times during the season. Um, and it's to used to maintain the trees at a low height. Large branches may sunburn if the prune is, pruning is excessive, so you want to whitewash. Now, Chuck worked in the Central Valley, so that's why he's got so much emphasis on whitewash. So there, the thing is that young fruit trees often require pruning. So if you don't head these branches and you let them get really long and lanky and they have a heavy fruit load, it can pull the branches over, it can pull a lot of the, the foliage over and expose the branches and they can sunburn. So we don't want that to happen. So you do sometimes have to prune young fruit trees to keep them healthy. Um, one of the things you're looking for when you're doing summer pruning, especially, but anytime you're building structure, even if it's winter pruning, so you wanna have radial separation of branches. So we're looking at an apricot from above here and on the upper left-hand corner, you can't see it incredibly well, but you can get the idea that different branches are coming off in a when we look down on the tree, there's different coming off at different radii. Um, you have them separated in orientation and you also have to have them um, separated vertically. We'll get to that in a second. So staking branches outward, if you have to, you can force them to radial separation in some base instead of pruning if you want to. Um, but you also need to have good vertical separation. Both of these trees have lousy vertical separation. The tree on the left hasn't broken yet. The tree on the right has broken. And once one branch goes, the other branches have less supporting wood and they start sh uh, shattering too. So this tree has com come completely apart because it did not have adequate vertical separation. So what we want it to look, okay, so we're gonna look at a couple different things. This open base or open center style is the most common. This is what it's gonna look like. There's an image, I think we have a better one here. Um, we're looking at, again, radio balancing, if you looked from above, and vertical separation. You'll notice that all three branches do not come from the same point on the trunk. They, um, they, and if this is done right, uh, an open base is the weakest structure of any of the structures we're gonna talk about but it's strong enough to do um, orchard work. And if it's strong enough to do orchard work, we're doing in pretty good shape. Cause that's, I mean, those guys are pretty rough with their trees in some cases. So um, the problem with an open center is you do have to fruit thin and you have to make sure you've got good vertical separation between your branches. And if it, all the separ uh, if the structure of the tree is decent and you don't overload it, it is strong enough to do the job, no problem. A central leader doesn't work with that. It's a very different thing. Now, a central leader is perhaps the strongest of all of the um, different fruit tree uh, pruning styles. Um, it, and it's a little bit like a pine tree. So you have this one leader that always goes up and you're always pruning to make sure that that leader is king and all the other branches are, um, are sub submitted to it. This means that we end up pruning a lot like a pine tree. You have your branches and whorls and you're gonna keep them separated. Now all those branches are gonna to wanna to go up. So you're gonna to have to also bend them down as you can see they're doing here. And this works great. This is a popular uh, method for apples, partly because they tend to grow pretty tall, um, but it does mean eventually you will likely need a ladder for um, harvesting the fruit. So people sometimes go for it Okay, let's see, wait a minute, central leader. Okay, so this is used for apples, pears, Asian pears. It's the best structural design. Um, you still get pretty good sunlight penetration. The taller trees are harvest, we already covered all this. Um, yeah, okay. 
So we use central leader for large truth. Um, and you want to establish a strong leader. So that's what we have on the left. What we, we've lost the leader on the center image and the right leader, uh, on the, and the right image. In the central image, you have one of your laterals hasn't been pruned down to keep it in good shape. Actually, that central, that, that left image looks like we're starting to have problems at the top too. The right image has two leaders competing for actually three leaders competing for to be, so one of those should be removed entirely. Another one should probably be pruned down and the last leader left in place. So you're, this is the kind of stuff that you're gonna have to make a sort of a active decision about. But if, so the tree on the right, I realize these are not fruit trees, that it's a liquid amber and a sycamore, but um, the sycamore on the right has a good, pretty decent standard uh, top. The picture on the left is terrible. You've got three main leaders going, and, and that's not going to work. One of the, and you can see the branches are going out in every case, and they're, they're going to create a, they're going to tear out sooner or later. And when they tear out, it's going to look like this. And it is the end of the tree, because neither of these trees are structurally sound enough to be able to keep them anymore. And for fruit trees that bear, bear heavy fruit loads, this will be the end of those two. So that's why we don't want to, um, we, why the central leader is a good idea and we want to make sure we keep the central leader there. You can do a modified central leader. And this is basically starting with the central leader and then going to an open base structure at the top where you are very careful about how you pick what um, your new branches are going to be. This is a decent way to get a tree high enough to keep deer from nibbling the, the, uh, all the fruit and everything off of it but still low enough that it's not, you know, 25 or 30 feet high. So, um, so this is modified central leader or delayed, op um, delayed open leader. Um, and you need, you can play with all kinds of different variations on this. We've already looked a little bit at the perpendicular V. This is what Chuck Ingalls was using to, he put in all these things here on, um, on his trees, took a bunch of them out later but the idea is you form basically a, uh, a V hedge and it gets plenty of sun and it still has reasonably decent structure and takes up a whole lot less room so you can plant more of them. A fruit bush, this is what I was talking about, Chuck wanting to keep, he's not naming one of these, but his idea is to basically keep the trees at about five and a half, six feet is the thing. And that means you're gonna be pruning them multiple times a year. The problem is, here is this, it's not a plan you can, uh, abandoned. Once you committed to this, you're kind of stuck with it. This is what happens if you miss a pruning. Got to do three times a summer, typically, at least once a summer. And if you don't do it, um, then you end up with some pretty big wood that won't re-sprout very well, and you've got a real mess on your hands. Um, so fruit bushes are best with semi-dwarfing rootstocks. There are advantages that you get tree maintenance, you don't have to use a ladder, they're good for small spaces, you get sequential ripening because trees, because you're pruning them so often, tend to um, put the fruit out, uh, instead of one big bushel, they put it out in several smaller groups. The disadvantage is you overall get less fruit, you get no shade, the timing of pruning is critical and so you have to pay attention and be there. Critters can get to your fruit and it's really pruning intensive. Um, so, Finally, the last one that we're going to talk about briefly is espalier. This is just as pruning intensive as the fruit bushes in many ways, maybe a little less so, but it's, you know, you're typically growing these trees either on a fence or um, against a wall. And it can be really good for, you know, growing trees in um, areas that are cold and you want to pick up some heat, particularly for citrus. But you can see it's pretty intensive, very formalized pruning. I mean, if cutting trees is what you like to do for fun, then this is, this is your thing. Um, okay, so enough about that. Fruit thinning, this is another really key thing and it's prob probably a good rule. Uh, there are exceptions to it, but in general, if you're growing stone fruits or you're growing palm fruits, you need to thin your tree. So the idea is to thin to uh, one fruit per cluster in general. Um, and there, there are exceptions to this, so we'll get into it. The reason we do this is this. 
with the number of increasing fruit to the, on the tree, your yield is the highest if you don't fruit if you don't prune anything. But each fruit will be dinky, um, so you'll get a thousand little tiny apples, um, and that's going to be kind of a hassle for picking them all. It's going to be kind of a hassle, and and it's not. Most people want bigger fruit than that. So as you, um, the other problem is with a really heavy fruit load like this, it can also break branches. So your tree can pull itself apart with really high fruit loads. So what we want to do is we want to thin those fruit, but we don't want to thin it to the point where you get one or two huge apples and nothing else. Um, so it's a thousand tiny apples on the right side of the scale. It's two huge apples on the left side of the scale. And what we probably want are like 30 or 40 medium sized apples is what we're aiming for. And that's where you get the best fruit without it being a huge amount of effort to pick and maintain. So fruit thinning increases fruit size, improves fruit color, can, it can improve fruit sweetness, reduces the number of diseases, especially brown rot and, thing, and, um, and coddling moth, things that like tightly bunched um, uh, fruits. Um, reduces problems with alternate bearing. I haven't explained what that is, but it's basically that a tree that produces a ton of fruit because um, it's on the right side of the graph in one year basically exhausts itself. It's used up a lot of its energy resources. So then the next year it sets very few fruit buds. Remember, a fruit programs it, the fruit tree programs itself in the summer. And if it's exhausted in the summer, it's like, I'm not doing that again. I'm not having that many kids. I can't handle it. Next year, I'm having two kids. So the next year, you get two apples out of your tree. And, the, and then the tree puts all its energy into new leaves and it gets all feeling happy and uh, kind of sexy. And it's saying, I'm gonna have a thousand kids next year. And you go into this cycle where it bounces back and forth between having a thousand fruits one year and just two fruits the next year. If you thin fruits, you will have a fairly consistent yield year after year. So that's alternate bearing. And it reduces the uh, problems with limb breakage. So how do we, through, uh, thin fruit. Let's see, well, how are we doing? We're getting close to noon. We're going to just get in there with um, hand pruners. That's one option if you can reach them. But the problem is that some fruit trees are taller than you can reach them. In fact, this person's fruit trees, they're, they, you know, of course, they show themselves pruning that nice branch they can reach, but you can see they've got a lot higher branches there. What are you going to do about those? Well, you can just put some end of a rubber hose on the end of an old broomstick and whack them and that'll knock some of them off. Notice you're doing this when the tree fruits are still quite small. These are, um, I think these are by the looks of it, apricots. Um, so you're trying to do this when they're quarter sized or maybe dime sized to try and knock some of the fruit out so that the tree will have fewer that it has to mature. You can use a number of different things, heavy wire, um, rubber hose or um, fan belts from a car and you can use those to pull fruits off a little more selectively uh, if reach is a problem. You want to time this right so you're looking for when you've got you know the fruit somewhere around three quarter to one inch in diameter in late April or early May and the spacing depends a little bit on your varietal and the tree vigor. Um, the fruit ideally shouldn't touch at harvest so that means you got to be able to predict that means peaches need four to six inches of clearance. Apricots need three to five inches of clearance. And apples, you want to thin to one fruit per cluster or about six inches across. Um, pears, you want to thin to one fruit, except Bartlett. And Bartlett, you don't want to, you don't want to um, thin at all. OK, uh, so flowering and fruiting problems. So. What happens when we get few to no um, flowers? Well, it can be no, due to a number of things. Perhaps most common is lack of chilling, but if you've picked the right um, varietal and it was a cold year, it could be that it was simply exhausted from last year. So that alternate bearing thing we were talking about, when it's overcropping last year, it'll be um, exhausted this year and it won't set fruit. It can be because of severe pruning or people cutting off um, fruit spurs. Or it could be that the tree is too young. And sometimes it means that you've got such a severe grafting compatibility problem, the graft didn't take well, 
that you've got something going on between your scion and your rootstock, and they're not getting along well enough to provide the top with enough water or the, or the roots with enough sugar, and you just have to regraft or, um, or perhaps replant. Okay, so that's, those are all potential reasons to not flower. What if you're flowering just fine, but your fruit is dropping? Well, some of it's normal. Some of it, um, sometimes, depending upon the varietal, citrus is pretty notorious for this. If it doesn't have a pollinizer, it likes, it'll still start to set fruit anyway, and then it'll drop it halfway through um, if it doesn't have a good pollinizer. Um, so it, or it can be lack of pollination. Some varietals will start to set fruit even if they're not pollinated, and then they'll abort halfway through. Or you've got you know, things like coddling moth, which is listed as a worm here, but it's not, it's insects. Um, diseases such as brown rot can cause this, fire blight can cause this, drought can cause this, depending upon the tree varietal. If the tree doesn't have enough water to be able to bring the fruit to bear, to, to maturity, then it will simply, it doesn't have water, the fruit will wither. Um, or fruit load. Again, fruit load is back to overcropping. It's the same idea. Um, small fruit, that's usually doing, due to overcropping or maybe you're dealing with a um, rootstock sucker that's grown in to be the mature thing. So um, small fruit, that's typically rootstock suck, suckers are going to be like, for instance, crab apples will often be used as a rootstock for your apple varietals because crab apples are very disease resistant and they're small so they can be dwarfing. If somebody lets the sucker grow up into the main tree, then you've got a crab apple tree with a root with a scion grafted onto at the base, and the scion's eventually going to get out competed. The, all that tree's ever going to be producing from here on out is these tiny little sour apples, and you're done. Um, so that's what they're saying about with the rootstock sucker. So um, lack of flavor. Sometimes it's varietal. Um, it's just not performing well, and in, in, you know, especially if it gets um, too hot, those kinds of things, or over irrigation. If it's just too wet, um, the fruit becomes kind of insipid. If it's split fruit or pits, this is often followed by uneven irrigation, um, and sometimes it comes down to varietal um, selection. Some fruits will split if they get sunburned and those kinds of things. Um, budding and grafted. So most true varietals have to be grafted because they don't breed true. So this means if you plant apple seeds, you're not going to necessarily get the apple that you pulled it from because they've got, there's a lot of things. That's why people graft is to keep the varietals true. Um, they also graft because the rootstocks you can pick are disease resistant, particularly as opposed for things like woolly appellated. Dwarf trees are um, popular because you can get Dwarfing rootstocks, they're easier to harvest. You get more trees per acre, you get earlier fruiting. There's a lot of advantages, but the bad thing is that they often require dwarf, well, semi dwarf, not so much, but true dwarf trees um, really don't have big enough root systems to survive summers without irrigation here. So you're going to have to stay on top of that. Um, the other reason that people bud and graft is you can add a pollinizer to a tree. Remember that pollen, that, that graft for the pollinizer doesn't have to be big. It can just put out a few flowers and that's going to be everything it needs. You can create fruit, fruit salad trees or um, you know, uh, fruit cocktail trees with this. Um, and there's a lot of different types and techniques for budding and grafting. The California Rare Fruit Growers holds a budding and grafting workshop every uh, February or so. Uh, and it's usually in Sebastopol. And you can buy rootstock from them for like five bucks and you can bring your own science or you can buy science from them. Um, it's pretty cool and they'll teach you how to bud graft. Um, so, you know, you can see the different, different graft unions are going to look different on different trees. So here you can see English walnut on black walnut. You can actually see the bark difference there. English walnut on paradox walnut, which is a hybrid between black walnut and English walnut doesn't look so dramatic, but you can still see the bark line pretty clearly. Um, this is a rootstock sucker where the main tree died, uh, so the rootstock survived, but the scion didn't take for one reason or another in the center. 
and you can see almond and apricot grafts there too. The graft is usually one of the weaker spots on the tree and it has to be taken care of and it needs to be above the soil line. Okay, so that's everything I've got on palm and stones. I wanna spend the last 15 minutes talking a little bit about citrus because there's been a lot of interest in that um, quickly and we're gonna start right on time. Um, okay, so let's talk very quickly about citrus. The standard citrus tree is to about 20 or more feet. You can buy dwarf citruses to six or 10. These are usually not dwarfed by rootstock. They're usually genetic dwarfs. Um, Meyer lemon isn't a true lime, lemon. It's uh, thought that it's got lemon with mixed intergrip with some orange genetics in it. It was discovered in China by 1908 by a guy named Frank Meyer. Mandarins are pretty much the same as tangerines. Um, tangerine was a uh, marketing strategy um, used because they were being uh, shipped out of Tangiers and from uh, orange orchards in Morocco. Uh, but they're really the same thing. There are a lot of different varietals of mandarins. It's a true orange, um, but uh, they tend to be very cold hardy and perform very well uh, in colder climates. So they do well in Marin. And two, two varietals that are known to do especially well in Marin are Satsuma, um, which produces early enough to miss a lot of the frost, and Pixie, which doesn't damage much by frost. So it hangs, the, the, the expression in the citrus world is it hangs well on the tree. Um, that means you don't have to harvest it right away as soon as it, um, as it uh, gets there. That said, we have, last year we got a lot of rain and we had a lot of trees that people were letting hang and they all, a lot of them got botrytis blight because even though they hang well, in really wet years in Marin, they, it's just not ideal citrus country. Um, so you do have to serve, if, if we're getting a lot of rain, you do have to pick those fruit because they won't hang on the tree forever. Soil consideration. Citrus don't need big, deep, rich soils. They do like moderately decent soils and you can plant them in valley bottoms, but they, um, they can thrive just fine on fairly poor soils if you fertilize them. And I don't think that's any really that different from any other tree. You know, if you fertilize, you can grow apples even on fairly uh, poor soils. But citrus seem to do a better with it than, than a lot of others. You'll find citrus groves on hillsides. You'll find citrus groves on fairly shallow soils, not a lot of, um, not super rich, and they, they thrive. So they, but the one thing citrus absolutely need more than most other fruit trees is good drainage. If you have bad drainage, you will get root rots and it will be a problem. So. Avoid heavy clay soils, although you can get away with heavy clay soils if they're well amended and or if they're on slopes. Um, raised beds and containers if the soil is really, um, is really poor or really heavy, uh, you can get away with putting them in, in these. But they will tend to outgrow containers. I know there's the, all these images out there of people growing citrus in barrels, and that's fine. They'll grow in barrels up to a point but eventually they will get root bound and you will start seeing effects of it. And the only way to avoid that is to pull them and bonsai them, which you can do, but it means if you bonsai them, you will be getting very few fruits and because you're gonna have to pull them and root pruning and that's a lot of work. So um, the other thing is people think that, you know, citrus are, are drought tolerant and yeah, they can be somewhat drought tolerant, but they will not produce good fruit crops because producing sugar takes water. So they will not produce decent fruit crops without it. So here's an image, a pretty graphic image of um, just how shallow the roots, so, so roots and citrus are. You know, that's a nice trench line and there's nothing below eight to 10 inches. Um, so citrus do not require the same kind of pruning regimen that a lot of the other fruit trees we've been talking about do. Uh, really all you're doing is shaping and you're trying to get a decent structure out of the, the, the young trees and then removing dead, or, dead wood from older trees. Um, the timing at, in early spring after frost is usually best after they've dropped their fruit. Um, and uh, you want to head or re remove strong upright shoots. Removal is preferable heading if the tree is looking a little on the thin side. 
Um, you want to keep the skirts pruned off the ground because uh, snails can be a problem. So can other pests. Rats like citrus trees a lot. Um, tall trees can be managed. You can reduce their height over three or so years. You can't do it all in one pruning. If you do, you will butcher them. Um, even if you do it over three years, you're going to probably have to whitewash uh, exposed limbs. And you, um, you can prune fairly severely to reshape and reinvigorate the tree. I don't recommend it. That's, that's something you can do if you need to. You're better off always pruning lightly if you can get away with it. Now, I said all that, and here they are in Southern California. They basically hedged them, and the skirts are right down to the ground, and it's a production citrus orchard. So, you know, they, you cannot follow the rules and still produce a decent crop. Um, and this is, uh, you know, these produce. This is Ojai, I think. But if you're not paying attention, this is what can happen. These are rootstock suckers, and they are root citrus when they are grafted are grafted onto pumelo, which this probably is, or sour orange. So if you're getting an orange that pr consistently produces sour fruits, or you're getting grapefruits that have very tiny fruit and inch and a rind that's two inches thick or an inch thick, that's pumelo. It's not grapefruit, and those are just garbage trees at this point now because they're um, they're on they're you're basically eating the fruit from rootstocks you could do a lot better the one problem with citrus and we had it this, that this morning is the citrus frost hazards they will burn in the in the frost um, burn in the frost that, that's not what I meant to say I'm clearly getting tired they they can get well I mean they call it frost burn but you know, frost damage um, so you can get it doesn't take much to stop citrus from getting frost damage. Um, all it takes is a little bit of a, a, a bit. In this case, they're just putting it on um, on T-bar, a simple cover. You can get a little more extreme and use uh, this. This is basically you've created your own greenhouse. The, the tr citrus tree will love this. You can do this all winter long. And if it's really a frost damage, you can put your holiday lights on the inside to help warm them. LEDs, I'm told, don't work very well for this. They don't produce enough um, warmth to make it significant. So you want to try and find uh, um, halogen or incandescence if you can do if you can to, for the things. The old style tree lights are getting hard to find, but they worked great for this. Cold hardiness of various citrus varietals. Um, kumquats are the most um, uh, frost tolerant of them. They can handle everything all the way down to like 19 degrees, which you almost never see in Marin. Whereas, uh, you know, your mandarins or sweet orange, your Meyer lemon, those are still pretty good, but beers, limes are not that fr um, frost tolerant. So, um, so they will damage at fairly moderate soil temperatures. Okay, so the summary here is that palm and stone fruits need um, chill hours. Citrus also, uh, citrus will produce without any chill, even in tropical environments. The only thing that citrus needs chill hours for is producing color on the fruit. So if you grow citrus in tropical environments, you will find oranges that have green skin and you'll cut them open and they'll be nice and sweet and orange on the inside. That same orange tree, if you grow it up here and it gets enough chill, will produce a nice orange skin. And it'll be the same thing on the inside. Um, palm and stone, so citrus needs chill hours only for color. Palm and stone fruits need chill hours for production. Palm and stone fruits need six hours of sun when they're in leaf, which is basically from March through September, so they can get away with a little less sun than citrus. Citrus needs six hours of sun and winter solstice. And so that means they're going to get, they need more sun, even though the numbers are the same. Citrus needs sun when, when it's in leaf, which is all year round. It needs six hours. Um, citrus needs very little pruning. Palm and stone fruits need pruning. They both need water. Um, palm and stone fruits need fruit thinning. Citrus usually doesn't. You can improve your crop with fruit thinning somewhat. Um, Citrus generally doesn't need much in the way of heat protection unless you prune it, and then you should uh, whitewash it uh, if you prune it hard. And that's about it. Can, the, I want to stop before I run completely out of time. Can we take the last five minutes for um, questions and that kind of thing? Absolutely.
Okay, um, do you wanna ask the questions or do you want me to ask the questions? Can you hear me speaking? Yeah. I can. Okay, I'm trying to find out where we last stepped off from our questions. Um, Do we, um, maybe it was Glenda's, do fruit trees do better when planted in plant, plant guilds? Is that what you meant to say, Glenda? Can you hear me, Stephen? I can hear you, Kay. I was just, no, I was just waiting. I thought you were asking Glenda if that's what she meant yeah, to say. I don't know if, if she- Guild, plant guilds. Guilds, plant guilds. Do fruit trees do better when planted in plant guilds? I'm not sure what exactly we're talking about when we're talking about plant guilds. Are we talking about with companion plantings? A lot of companion plantings have yes. been shown. Ah, got it. Okay. Companion plantings, there is something there. Um, a little, it's one of those topics that verges on mythology, but it has some bit roots in science too. Um, certainly when you put, you know, beans in with corn and, and, and those kinds of things, um, beans are climbers, corn produces some pretty tr strong stalks. So both plants benefit because the beans can climb the corn and the corn, I'm sorry, the beans can use the corn for structure and the corn can benefit from when the bean loses, beans lose leaves and things like that, the beans fix nitrogen and things along those lines. And so there are certain um, plant associations that you can actually quantify the things to. A lot of other people have gone through and taken sort of that wisdom and to an extreme. And it, any wisdom taken to extreme starts to become folly. So they've started making all these different associations between plants and saying all these different things do better if you plant them together. And some of them, when they've tested it, really don't pan out. So fruit trees, um, <laughs> somebody's <really excited. laughs> fruit trees don't necessarily, to the best of my knowledge, thrive better with plant guilds, other than we can talk about, and in the backyard, this is not going to be much of an issue, but when we start talking about almond trees, which are part of the fruit tree group, um, or you know, even apricots and peaches and things like that, when you have a monoculture and you're bringing bees in, the, the, the bees need uh, uh, other associated plants to help them through the year. If you're trucking bees in, it's really stressful on the bees, yada, yada, yada. In a garden situation, generally you're not in a situation where you're in such a big monocrop that you're having problems with that. The bees can find plenty of things to forage on. So no, generally speaking, trees from our perspective, you don't have to worry about plant guilds because there's plenty of variety around them. Now, maybe if you've got an orchard growing in Sebastopol someplace and you have something like 30 acres, maybe the trees in the middle of that 30 acres will struggle a little bit. Maybe you do want to think about having something there to help the insects uh, have a more balanced nutritional program and have flowers throughout the years, year so you can keep the native bees alive, those kinds of things. I, so I, I think the short answer is not really, not for fruit trees. The longer answer is it can depend on your situation. Great, thanks Stephen. Uh, Richard asks, what are the best fruit trees for Marin home landscapes? Um, definitely cherimoya and guava. No, I'm, um, I'm kidding. Uh, that depends a lot on your preferences. Um, Paul Vossen was our uh, specialty crops advisor you can find his lists of his favorite fruit trees on UCCE Sonoma. He's forgotten and tested more about it than I ever will ever know. So I'm gonna refer you over to him. Um, the Home Orchard and a number of other things you can find, and you can talk to the folks at the California Rare Fruit Growers. I know when it say, I say rare fruits, everybody's thinking, oh, they're talking jujubes and they're talking dragon fruit. And no, we're not. They, I mean, they do, some of them do jujubes and dragon fruit. Um, you could grow both of those here or at least in California. Um, but a lot of the rare fruit, quote unquote, that they're talking about is uh, our, our cider apples and, and cellar apples and, and things that just don't have a, 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 a really 
modern technology has taken away the need for cellar apples. They stored really well. They were inedible when they first came off the tree. They didn't sweeten up for six months. So, you know, um, people used to grow cellar apples so that they would have good storage apples that they could have for a while. That's now with modern people shipping stuff all over the world, it's unnecessary. Um, so the California rare fruit growers know an awful lot about this kind of stuff. And they will even have sometimes tastings and things. You can decide what you want to do. It's worth planning. Um, do, do your homework, do your research, look at Paul Boston's website, talk to Dave Wilson if you want to, go read the um, Home Orchard and talk to the, join the California rare fruit growers and explore those options. Um, really pay off, in your homework will really pay off in terms of you'll be much happier with your trees than just going down and picking something out of Costco. I'm not picking on Costco. I bought, I bought stuff there too. Um, anyway, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, Emery asks, um, would mixing biochar into the original soil when planting help the roots or would you just add it on top? Biochar, I, uh, that depends on your soil. If you're working in the Santa Rosa Laguna or another nice valley bottom uh, with really good uh, alluvial soils, mixing biochar into your soil is not going to have any noticeable effect. If you're working on some thin, scrabbly, Tiburon serpentine-based clay, adding biochar to your soil would probably be a good idea. Again, it's organic matter. It doesn't break down as quickly as other organic matter. It is still organic matter. It will still break down over time. Um, and so I would not put it underneath my plant. I would put it in the soil surrounding my plant, maybe, you know, in the, uh, and, and maybe even in the soil outside the plant. You could work it in before you plant it. Do be aware, biochar is almost pure carbon. There is no nitrogen. If you work, find enough biochar into your soils, you will cause a nitrogen deficiency, almost guaranteed. So you're gonna have to figure out how to balance that. One of the better ways to balance that is not to do that and just work carbon into your, I'm sorry, compost into your soil or just layer it on top. Small amounts of carbon are not gonna cause nitrogen deficiency. Working large amounts of biochar into your surface soils without balancing it with some kind of nitrogen could potentially cause a problem. Thanks, Stephen. Jeff asks, summer pruning seems to be a bit of a misnomer. In our handbook, it lists leaf out to July for when to make these cuts. Does that mesh with your experience? Uh, it's horses for courses a little bit. It depends a little bit on how are your fruit trees behaving? When are they bearing fruit? Are they early bearers or late bearers and those kinds of things? If your tree has already borne its fruit by June, uh, which is some, some early varietals will, can do, um, then you can, yeah, absolutely, you can prune um, in, uh, in July. Uh, one of the big reasons we would summer prune in the first place is when we're training young trees, um, not necessarily on, on older trees. So summer pruning might be more important earlier in the year when we're really not concerned about getting fruit. So yeah, you can prune any time before leaf fall is probably a better time to prune in some of those things. And yeah, you might consider pruning in August and September because the point here isn't worrying about your fruit, your crop. You're just worrying about getting some uh, a great structure. So I don't disagree with your statement that it's a bit of a misnomer. It can be in some cases. In fact, I... I don't, I'm not a big, I put Chuck's in there because, uh, Chuck's points in there, because I want you to hear a different perspective than just mine. Um, I prefer to leave my trees fairly natural. I like to let them get, I like to look at them as real trees. And I, um, um, I like setting up the summer pruning and then I like leaving my trees largely natural and I don't prune that much in the summer. I don't know if that helps, but you can do whatever you want to do, you know? Okay, thanks, Stephen. Jeff goes on to ask, and what are the differences of summer pruning in April versus in July? Does one affect growth more than the other? The earlier you prune, the harder it's going to be on a tree. So let's think about the, the um, so after trees have leafed out, they have invested a lot in those leaves. Leaves aren't, 
leaves have varying levels of expense. An evergreen leaf is much more expensive to produce than some simple deciduous leaf, but it still costs the tree to put all those leaves out. If you prune those branches and leaves off before the tree has had to choose, even had a chance to make back its investment in those leaves, you are damaging that tree. So you want to prune as late as you feasibly can in, in the year. At the same time, I mean, to, so that the plant gets its, its investment back. But at the same time, you're trying to bring fruit to bear and a bunch of other factors. And that's why I'm saying it's complicated. It, I don't have a right answer for you other than to say the pruning in July is better for the tree. Pruning in June is gonna, in terms of energy getting back, pruning in June, the tree will have more time to close wounds and things like that over the, the given year. That's a problem. If that's a problem for you, type but then you've got to prune in June or July, or maybe early July. You don't want to wait until September. Um, so it's a horses for courses. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we really, when you get right down to it, have that much choice. When you look at the tree trying to put, trying to get a crop off the tree, trying to do all the various different, keep diseases out of the tree, keep all the various different things on, you're going to find you probably have one optimal window for that tree for summer pruning if you decide to do summer pruning at all and you don't have to unless you got apricots or cherries because you can't do winter pruning so if you're going to prune you got to do it in summer um you'll find you've got one optimal window and that's about the only optimal window you're going to have and that's going to depend a little bit on your values not always science is going to be able to say this is the time i'm sorry to say Okay, Stephen Jeff's next question. If we didn't get the Utypa memo and already did our pruning for cherries, apricots, what can we do or look for to see if we have an infection? Well, Utypa, you can look on up on UCIPM, you can go to apricots. It's not listed for cherries. It will infect cherries, but don't go try and look it up on cherries because it's only listed for apricots. Um, Utypa, you will be able to see, um, Utypa, you can't, see externally all that easily. Like you'll get dying branches that ooze an amber liquid, but all trees, when they're, all fruit, all of these fruit trees anyway, in the rose family, ooze an amber liquid when they're damaged by pests or diseases, including sometimes if you just nick them at the right time of year, they'll ooze an amber liquid. So um, the, the amber liquid isn't diagnostic for Utypa in any way, shape or form. And it may that be that you only have something minor going on. If you lose the branch, if you cut uh, crosswise across the branch, you will see a discolored dark area in, in the cross section of the branch that is either V or U shaped where the bleeding occurs. That is fairly diagnostic for you type. So if you see that, you've got a problem. Um, otherwise, uh, don't worry about it. Just because you pruned in the winter doesn't mean your plants are doomed. It just means you've opened an opportunity for them to get the disease. They may not have gotten it, in which case you got away with it this year. Good for you. Okay, next question. Can we whitewash, why, excuse me, can we whitewash over two-year-old cherries that may already have sunburn damage? Does the whitewash further damage the sunburnt areas? No, the whitewash doesn't damage the sunburned areas. Um, the whitewash uh, will probably aid the healing of those sunburned areas. Uh, when my landlord, my, I used to rent, my landlord planted some um, uh, ornamental trees. Um, the name's escaping me right now. Um, but he brought them in and planted them. And right before we left for vacation and the bur trees burned on this, their southwestern sides, uh, I whitewashed those trees and um, they grew back really, really well. Um, so the point here is the, the, the tissue, if it keeps burning, will keep dying back. So I would still suggest you whitewash the trees. I hope I answered your question. Okay, next question from Florencia. If you get too much fruit on your tree, do you need to remove some? When is yeah. the best moment to do so? And would this improve the quality of the fruit left on the tree? That's the whole point of fruit thinning. You want to remove, you want to, it's not so much for citrus, but if you've got something in the rosaceae, so, you know, stone fruits, palm fruits, those kinds of things, and it's not Bartlett pear, 
then yeah, you want to thin your fruit probably somewhere around, depending upon how much fruit sets. I mean, if you're getting, if it's a bad fruit set year, then you don't thin it at all. If it's a really heavy fruit set year, you might take off two thirds or even three quarters of the fruit. You don't want to over thin because if you take over thin, you just set off alternate bearing on a different year cycle. So maybe you take half the fruit off of the tree um, and that will produce larger, better tasting, healthier fruit than you would if you didn't thin, absolutely. Next question from Jeff. Between open center and central leader, what method of training works best when trying to keep trees small, less than 10 feet tall? Open center. Um, central leader is always going to produce a tall tree and you're always gonna want, um, you're gonna, always gonna need a ladder. If you do modified central leader, you might be able to stop it at a point where a ladder isn't impractical, but a, a true central leader tree will reach 20 feet easily. So I would, most people go for that open center vase shape. And there's a reason for that. The only problem is you gotta be pretty careful when you're training the trees to make sure you get good vertical and horizontal separation. And you gotta really pay more attention to the fruit loading because if tree will try and pull itself apart. So, you know, you can, if you do a central leader, you're on a ladder, uh, but at the same time, you have a lot less worry about managing fruit and loads and things like that. And you know, then you're gonna have to get up on the ladder, not just to harvest the fruit, but to thin the fruit and everything else. So you're doing a lot of ladder work. It's not ideal. I think most people go for open center. Okay, next question. Do you thin the fruit of the fig tree? No, uh, generally speaking, figs don't require, I mean, you can uh, when they're little, if you find that you're getting a lot of really tiny figs and you'd rather get bigger figs, but they don't overproduce to the point where they injure themselves. You do still have to pull all the fruit away. If you get fruit mummies, you can still get diseases into figs, all kinds of other stuff. Sanitation, 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 keep it clean. Um, but no, you don't have to, you don't have to thin fruit, fig fruits necessarily. Next question from Barrett. Can you grow an avocado tree in Marin that will produce fruit? Oh, absolutely. The question is, you know, most people have expectations. So there are some cold, hardy Mexican avocados that will produce reasonably well. They're not going to necessarily be as big or as, um, are as buttery as the Haas that we're all used to getting in stores. There's a reason Haas is really popular, um, but you can grow avocados here. Your big worry about growing avocados in Marin is gonna be this Phytophthora called Phytophthora cinnamomi that's famous for killing them, the, killing avocado trees the world over. And uh, you will need to keep a very clean orchard and minimize traffic through it and not plant it with a bunch of other stuff. And you'll also need to be very careful about your summer irrigation. Irrigation during warm weather is going to be very challenging, but you can do it. And it's been done successfully. Okay, next question from Glenda. I think she's referring back to that picture of the big suckers coming off the rootstock. Can you prune off suckers that big? Can you bring a citrus tree back from having been taken over by the rootstock? You can try. Um, the problem is, and I know I'm anthropomorphizing here, um, when I say the tree learns that it can make good, uh, better life, a better life for itself by producing suckers, it, it does learn, not necessarily in a sense of, you know, reading this stuff or understanding it in a way, but what happens is you change the hormone balance and you change the growth structure of the tree. So it's not learning in a neural sense, like we learn, but it's still learning in that cells develop to move, just like cells in a brain develop, the more times you think of in a certain way, you tend to reinforce those neurons. So that's why habits are really great things to help you develop what you wanna do in life. The plant learns from how to. The plant is not neurological, but it's still, once the plant develops big pathways to develop those huge suckers, you cut those suckers off, it's going to want to, those big pathways exist. It's going to want to put it back on there. So you are going to be having a, a continuing struggle with managing those suckers until you can get the 
scion big enough that it, the plant prefers to go that route again. So it can be done, it's a lot of work, and there's no guarantee of your success of whether you can catch it in time. Does that make sense? Okay, next question from Jeff. Are, are Glenda, Glenda, did you get your question answered? I did, yes, thank you so much. Okay, good. Okay, next question from Jeff. I bought a citrus that has irregular yellowing patterns on the leaves, making me think it has HBL. How can I report this or have it confirmed? The tree hasn't been planted yet, seems to have been at the nursery for over one year. Okay, so um, there's a couple things in here, Jeff, and that's a complicated question. So let's start with the, the easiest things to answer. If you want to uh, have your tree sampled for Huang Long Bing um, or Asian, not Asian citrus salad, um, then you should bring it to the Marin County Agricultural Commissioner and they can have it, they can test it for you if it's not in the ground. Um, they can send somebody out to test it if it is in the ground and confirm whether or not it has Huang Long Bing. That said, um, citrus trees in Marin County, um, especially if this is fairly recently purchased, tend to show yellowing in the leaves, one, when they're in pots, and two, in the spring. There's a couple reasons for this. So the yellowing in pots is what we always run across. That's the first symptom, especially if it's been in the pot for a long time, that it's root bound. And uh, we start seeing yellowing in the beginning and then we end up getting leaf tip burn as the binding becomes more and more significant. You may just be looking at root binding, in which case um, you want to rinse all the soil off of that thing, make sure there's no um, circling roots in there and plant it out into the landscape and give it a year and see if how th at things fare. The other problem is citrus are subtropical trees and we are not in a subtropical environment. This means citrus runs typically run nitrogen shortages in the spring, even when there's plenty of nitrogen in the soil, because for some reason, citrus, when it's cold, doesn't metabolize nitrogen properly. So new growth on citrus in cold spring environments tends to be awfully chlorotic anyway, and it will warm up once the temperatures warm up. So you are possibly looking at two different things uh, contributing to the um, the chlorosis in the leaves and the combination of the two can often lead to irregular leaf symptoms. So I wouldn't be so worried about Wang Long Bing just yet because it's pretty normal for a citrus tree in, that's been root bound in a pot in the spring to be showing the symptoms that you're describing. Okay, that, next. Is that? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think I'll take a sample in just to make sure because it does look significantly different. I bought other ones that also have yellowing and the, the yellowing pattern is very different in this one particular tree. Okay, well, you can take that up with the Ag Commissioner. They should be able to test it for you. Great, thank you, Stephen. All right, thanks, Stephen. From Susan, why do you not thin Bartlett pear trees? I don't know. I think that's the nice short answer. It's what um, the, it's what, Oh, I'm trying to remember her name. Up in Lake County, they still grow quite a few pears, and it, that piece of information came from the pear advisor up there. She said, you don't thin Bartlett pears. I think it had something to do with potential damage, or when you cut them, sometimes the, you ended up with the, the, the drying going back into the bud and killing the other pear at the same time. I think it had something to do with the lack of survival for the remaining pear, but I can't tell you what that mechanism is. I don't know, I don't remember. Okay, and the final question from Debbie is when planting on a slope, should you create a level area for the hole or how do you best expose the root crown at a slanted grade? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, most people who do plant on slopes tend to dig back in the slope a little bit more and then you know, sort of line that, um, that incision in with rocks or something to help support it so that soil doesn't slump down on top of the root ball of your tree. And maybe build a little bit proud out from the slope too, but that tends to weather away pretty quickly if you're not really careful about how you do it. So um, most people cut into the slope a little bit to create a bare spot. 
the severity of the slope does matter. Um, but, you, and, and yes, I, generally speaking, most, that's the way it's typically done. I have seen people on milder slopes get away with just planting straight into the mild slope and not worry too much about a little bit of soil buildup on one side of the tree. It's, if, if, if it's not that steep, it's not that bad. Did that answer it? Debbie, is that a good answer? Do you have anything else? I don't, I don't hear me. Hear. <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute. Yes, um, I think uh, it might be still a little too steep, but that was helpful, thank you. Okay. Uh, try making a nice flat spot for it and you'll, you'll do okay. Okay, cool. Would you make a little mound on the part that you've flattened? No. Or would that just wind up washing away? No, uh, if, you're, if you're asking about planting high in that spot, the slope by itself is going to provide you with so much drainage that you don't need to worry about making sure you plant the rootstock oh. the root crown high. If you're worried, if you're talking about making a little mound on the downhill side of the slope so that it's sitting on a slightly larger air, flat area, yeah, you could try and do that. The problem being the soil tends to wash away from those, so you're going to have to reinforce it a little bit somehow to right. keep it from, from Yeah, water. I guess I was just worried that the, like the downhill part of the roots that then too much would be exposed. You know what I mean? If it I if do. you have, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You should see yeah. my first line. You can see the entire rootstock. It, right now it's sitting above grade um, and it's doing fine. So uh, exposing roots oh. isn't as big a problem as um, burying them. I mean, I'm not oh, saying okay. my first line is perfect. I will be adding some soil back to it so that it, um, but it, it's in a barrel right now and the, the barrels just sort the organic matter uh, broken down so quickly that the, the root ball is exposed right now. It's fun. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. So if, if there are no more questions, and I don't see anyone has typed any more into the chat, uh, Stephen, thank you very much for another fantastic presentation. Hey, you guys, I just want to say thank you for sticking with us through this. This is not how we usually do the Master Garden class, and I'm very <laughs> sorry for all of you that you don't get to hang out together because that is really the best part of the class. Um, so with any luck, um, you won't have to listen to too many of the more of these online lectures and, uh, and stick with it anyway. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, Stephen.